the petty side of me was like, if you hate me, you gotta go to work on public transport and see my face every day. Yeah. The fact that we got as far as we did doing everything wrong is a miracle. We have this idea of what industry is, and we think it's like some big Illuminati, you can't get into it, but it's not. Dreamy days. You're never hearing dreamy days in the club. I'm not the best rapper, but I'm one of the hardest working. So I just outwork everybody. That's what I do. <laughs> and you missed the trick there, bro. <laughs> the genesis I know is one day he'll die, the next day he'll be back. Yeah, you can't fuck with me. One of us is going to end up dead and the other one's going to end up arrested. Over what? No one out here is too real. It's just because you're just not doing the correct things to be put in those positions. Bro, you are boring the fuck out of me. You've pushed me to a point where I won't allow myself to fail now. You have no haters. Some people think you're a prick. One day, the world will know all my songs, and the ones who doubted will say they knew it all along. A powerful statement, which could easily be confused as the ravings of a deluded artist. But in the case of my guest today, with his work ethic, his consistency, his determination, and his lack of fear to try new and different things, I believe him. Before we begin though, please subscribe to the channel, click the bell to receive the notifications, like, share, and get involved in the comment section below. I've seen this guy hustling on the streets with my own eyes. And whether he succeeds or fails, he's never known to lose faith. Not in my eyes anyway. But instead, he always finds another way. And when he says he was built to last, you best believe him. On the 521 docu chat today, I have the versatile, the unstoppable powerhouse that is Genesis Elijah. What's going on, bro? Exactly. You good? You're good. <laughs> Always blessed, man. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. You know, we, we've known each other a long time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we can talk about how we met and how you impacted me in the sense of, like, I knew I had to pay attention. But what I want to know in the, in the very beginning is what happened in your childhood to turn you into that man-made monster lyricist and MC? Do you know what? I think I just, I was always like interested in rap music and like my cousins obviously listened to like Big Daddy Kane and LL Cool J and all that kind of stuff. And once, once I found Ice Cube, then that was, it was a rap man. It's like Ice Cube, NWA, then kind of getting into Big Daddy Kane myself. And it just, it just kind of snowballed from there, man. Yeah. Yeah. That was the that was like the that was the tra trajectory. That's how it all went. That's the the timeline of me kind of figuring out. Oh, this is what adults do. Adults, all the cool adults rap. That's what I want to do. Was that all going on in the house, or were you catching it all outside the house? What what was what was the background? In my house, there was no, no secular music. My dad's a preacher. Like there's there's only Christian music in my house. So the only time I would hear music from outside would be at my cousins. Or my uncles so I would go over there I would look at like they'd have obviously they've got the vinyls out so I'm, I'm going through the vinyls seeing like just looking at me like look at a Big Daddy Kane cover it's cold right Long so Daddy yeah, yeah. so you're looking at that we like he's got the girls he's got the jewels to me that was just mind-blowing then my, my uncle was an avid music collector so he would have whatever's new that was out he would have so as soon as the Chronic dropped, like he had that, Snoop, Wu-Tang, like, so anything he, I'd, every Sunday we would, we would go church and then we go to my nan's. That's where my uncle lives. So as soon as we get to my nan's, I'm going upstairs, I'm seeing what new CDs he's got, going through it. I'd have my tape, my cassette ready. I'd tape, cassette, like record whatever new CDs was there. Either that, or I'd just steal them, just take them. Like when I got my CD player, that was it, I was taking them. But like, yeah, just kind of just seeing what the, that's how I was getting my, my music. Other than that, when I was at home, from, from a very, very young age, like I'm talking from maybe six, seven, I would always have my, my little, a little radio and I would go to bed listening to, the, to music. So I listened to, to Kiss when it was like pirate. Like, so I was, you know what I mean? Finding, and I would always, you switch stations. But I was always going for like hip hop. I was into like R&B was cool. Used to like, um, like dance hall. And like the dub side of things, but yeah, that was my the 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 hip hop, the rap. That was where I was. I was. 
that was sort of drawn me in, man. You said your dad was into the whole church thing and everything. Mm. How, how did that impact your ability to listen to the music in the house? Nah, nah, never. You can't listen, to, couldn't listen to it in the house. Even when I got older, like I'm talking, when I was like 15, 16, maybe not 16, but when I was like maybe like 13, 14, and I was already buying my own music, like I could play it on my headphones, but I couldn't play it out loud. And even then, one time my mum, she found, what CD was it? I think it was Eminem. She found an Eminem CD, played one track or something. She snapped that, man. <laughs> she mashed that up. Like, she was like, and she, and she was like, and it was so hard to break, man. I could feel the demons holding it together. I'm like, yo, <laughs> mum, chill. You on the vibe, man. Like, but that's the, that's like the, that's the kind of household I came from. It was at, obviously now there were a lot of people kind of mellow, but back then, Anything outside of church, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't the one. So you kind of had to be a little bit careful with like what you did. Even with when I was rapping, so I would at school, I would still exercise books to write my rhymes in. And again, one time I come home, and all my rhyme books are gone. My mum found them, had swearing in it. She binned them all. Like yeah, I was like I was like maybe twelve years old then, and she was like yeah, I read your raps. Like, and I always felt like I always felt like she missed a trick, man, because I felt like. You, you found um, almost like no one was really writing journals or diaries then, yeah? But that's like you have an insight into your young son's mind but because they're swearing and you throw it all away. That's literally, to me, it's like, well, not literally, it's practically throwing out the baby with a bathwater and I was always like, nah, you could have, you should have read it, man. Like, there was some stuff in there that you would have, you would have understood me better if you read it but I think a lot of times people are, um, wrapped up in their version of what life should be and sometimes that comes above their own children. Man. You know, off camera we were talking about um, the Williams sisters with the tennis and everything, right? Yeah. And how their dad had this plan for them and everything. And maybe it was a case of like your parents had a certain plan for you yeah, and did. you didn't go with the path they set 100%. on for you. To me that's, I don't want to say bad parenting, um, but it's it's... In my view, it's not the best way to go about parenting. So you shouldn't come with a preconceived notion about who your child is going to be or become based on your beliefs or the way you see the world. There's certain things here that I want for my kids. Like I don't want my kids to be addicted to drugs. I don't want my kids to be involved in, in violence, that kind of stuff. But other than that, whatever you want to be, like you go do that. Like, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try my best to support what you want to do rather than try to stop you from pursuing a thing that you that you love. Obviously, you're a parent yourself now. Mm. And uh, do you practice those morals that you're talking about? Yeah, man, my kids do what ethics. they want. Like, do you, you got, there's, to me, there's, there's certain things in the world that, there's, there's universal laws. There's certain things that you, you shouldn't do. Like, you shouldn't hurt others. You should try to look after yourself and look after those around you. Other than that, knock yourself out, man. Don't disrespect yourself. Don't disrespect me. And everything will be cool. The one thing that I think uh, I noticed pretty much straight away with you was the way you attack life. Like, even when I first met you, you had this certain energy about you. Mm -hmm. And you're a guy that, as I've got to know you, you've always kind of taken negatives and made them into positives. Do you want to tell us where all that comes from? I feed off negative energy. I'm not the person to go, oh, me and you both. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, like... If you, if you look at my so life... Can I, you know, can I just cut you there for a second? <laughs> yeah, can, right, the more negativity you throw at me, the more chances I'm going to be the person you don't want me to be. And fuck you, facts. cameraman. <laughs> <laughs> like, facts. Like, I'm the... I guess, actually, wait, I can give you a, a really good example, um, which may not make as much sense now, but it will, it will kind of, in a way. Back in the day, it made sense. So when I was younger, there was this guy, we were playing basketball, and he was like, um, bro, you're the only black dude I know, yeah? He's got no muscle definition, man. You've got no muscles. And I was like, oh, yeah? All right, cool. And then I just went and started doing weights. <laughs> like, I just got wedged. Like, and then I saw him, like, a few years after I started working out, and he's like, bro, like, what? You know what I mean? Like, I'm going to do it. Like, I had one guy tell me one time, again, I'm, I'm, I'm a spiteful dude. Like, he must have made a joke about me not having a license. So, because I, I don't know, and I just 
10, did 10 lessons, got my license. I thought you were going to say you went to like all the countries around the world and got, <laughs> I got all the every licenses. Lessons. But that's the thing, it's like... If you, I can imagine you doing that though. If, if, if it came to that, I'm, I'm, if, if someone says to me, yeah, you can do it, Jen. I'm kind of like, all right, whatever. But if someone says, nah, you can't do that. Then I'm like, uh, watch, I'm going to do it now just because you said I can't do it. And sometimes I even get excited because then I'm like, oh my God, I'm actually going to do it. <laughs> like, they said I couldn't and I just know myself. I just know like, you've pushed me to a point where I won't, I won't allow myself to fail now because you've said I'm going to fail. So I'm going to do it. And I feel like even with, even with music, man, like I've, all, I've had um, people tell me, yeah, like music, you're never going to, make money from music, you're never gonna succeed in music. And I feel like that's part of the reason why I've been like, okay, watch me. Like, that's just the way But, but also, goes. that wasn't the real reason that you got into the music in the first place, so did nah. it matter? Nah, nah, like I think as you get older, you, you remember certain things, yeah? So you kind of remember the process of it. So me, one of my favorite things in life is making a song from scratch and it's finished and just listening to it. And no one else has heard it yet. Just, just me. I'm listening to the track and I'm loving it. And, it. and it's kind of like, I made this. Like, that's, it, it's a product. It's something that I've made. I love being creative. I love creating things. As an artist, um, it's also like, it's a diary of where you are at that particular moment Fact. in your life, you know? 100%. I so can listen people to want to find out about you, <laughs> listen to the music. Uh, uh, 100%. I say that a bit loosely because there are artists you can do that with, but there are artists you couldn't because they just say nothing. Yeah, there's a, there's a, I guess it depends like what, why do you do it? So for me, a lot of it, a lot of music is to do with legacy. So it's to do with like, in my brain, I always feel like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die one day and then my great-great-grandchildren are going to hear my music and go like, oh, is that what, so that's what he was on. And people are going to find it after I'm gone and that's what it will mean more. That's in my brain. That's the way I see it. You want to see how I see it in my brain? How's that? The genesis I know is one day he'll die and the next day he'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I forgot something. Actually, no, 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 I'm not done. I'm not finished arguing. Like... Yeah, so I think the, I'm, I, I really do make music and the way I, because I don't, I don't write bars, I just write, I just record in it. So, I, and the reason I do that is because when I record, I want to be in the moment. So I want it to be like, what's happening in this moment, I want to record, I want to feel it and I want you to kind of get it as well. So a lot of what I do is, is done for that man. It's done, it's not for me, it's, it's for my kids. For them, for my grandkids, one day they can listen and go, oh, oh, cool. That's what granddad was on, yeah? So This part that I'm going to ask now is generally something that people always ask at the end of an interview. But I want to get it out of the way early because I feel like people sometimes don't get to the end of the interview. All right, right? Cool. And I think it's also important that certain people got their, their names checked mm. um, and pretty much give them their flowers. There were okay. certain people, um, you know, that basically were good to you mm. in, your, in your rise to where you got to. Do you want to shout out a few names and maybe Damn. give a quick explanation? Like, I, I saw somewhere, um, Leke. Yeah, man. Yeah, always, we're always safe. Like, we weren't, like, super close, but he's one of them people that, every time I saw him, the energy was good. Anything he had popping off, he'd always give me a shout about. And, like, he was one of the first... One of the first times I met him, I was with my daughters, he's with his daughters. And my daughter's a little bit older than his daughters. And... It was, it was an event and it was cool because it was just like, oh, like, we're family guys out here, you know what I mean? And it kind of shows, like, I think his, his missus, my missus were chatting and, like, I've, I've always said, when it comes to, like, who you are as a person, let me go back a little bit. We have this thing, yeah, because people rap, we think they're great. I don't care if you rap good. If you rap good, I'll listen to your music. But as a person, you get no respect from me just because you rap well. I want to know who you are as a person, then I respect that. So again, it comes down to how do you treat your family and how do you treat others around you? That's where the respect comes from. So for me, him would always get the, the, the most amount of respect because he was about his family, man. Like that was important to him. And not just from that meeting that we had when we first met, I've always seen that about him. That's, that's like his, his thing, man. And that's what I respect. All the other stuff, yeah, that's cool. There's a whole bunch of people that can rap really well, make the best music, but they're fucking scumbags. 
So I don't give a fuck. It's like whatever in it. Like I don't. Yeah, your music. Should we cool. spend the next five minutes just name checking and all of them? <laughs> we'd be all we'd be all fucking day, man. Oh, like, well, you know what? Let's, let's just switch the interview into that mode. So, <laughs> scumbags. <laughs> like, there's, there's there's loads of a minute, and like, I'm not even saying that I can't be a scumbag, but I think like, if you're if you're going to respect me for something, yeah, you might like my music. That's cool, but maybe you should find out a little bit about me as a person. Am I the, am I somebody who you should? look up to or want to be like or even hold in that regard and that has to be more it's got to be deeper than he rhymes words really well like he gives a fuck man the thing is i wanted to get that leke bit out of the way cool, because cool, obviously cool, cool. he passed away mm. at the end of last year yeah. which was really sad um you know like he he tried to help a lot of people along the way to his company i wanted to make sure that he got another mention yeah because it's so easy to forget the people that have done stuff that's true man but I wouldn't even, I'm not going to mention anyone who's still alive right now because there's too many to mention. But I will mention Ty. Like Ty is somebody who was someone I could um, get get guidance from and someone who was very, um, like me and him, we never saw eye to eye on a lot of things. Like we were always bumping heads, yeah? But it's done in love. Ty took this music thing, this rap thing, this culture very seriously. I'm a bit younger than him, right? So I'm from a generation where we're a little bit more outlandish in the, in how we speak and what we do and what we say. And he was never afraid to pull me up and be like, nah, bro, like that ain't that. But at the same time, I don't think I've ever done a show in South London where he wasn't there. I didn't invite him. I didn't say, yo, Ty, I've got a show, come down. Nah, he just turned up because he's, he's just supporting like that. Like all the time. If I, if I dropped music or whatever, he would be like, yo, I like this or I don't like this or whatever. And that, like, I love that. It was one time where I was on, this was the Facebook days when I was still on Facebook like that and I must have, I was just ranting about something and he DM'd me and was like, bro, you're winning and you don't even know it, bro. Like, you're actually winning. I just started crying, man. Like, he was he was that kind of person who just, was a, he's a, just a real guy. And I think, like, a lot of times we talk about um, mentors and, like, who who are the found who are the foundation of this of this scene, and he's one of those people. And a, a lot of times it's just leading by example. Even the music he made, his 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 music was super instrumental into how I I changed in how I made my music. Because when because when I first started, this obviously like I said, I'm listening to Ice Cube. Ice Cube's killing everyone. NWA, they're killing everyone. Snoop's killing everyone. Bob Deep, Wu Tang, everyone's just the most hardest people you ever knew ever. Then I'm moving to UK hip hop, and even though it's it's a lot more realistic, so you've got Roots Maneuver who's talking about just life, that's cool. But at the same time, it's still never really been vulnerable with like as a rapper. The first time I heard Hercules, remember me, fool? That just I just got goosebumps now that just hit me different because it's like oh wait you don't have to be the toughest in the world all the time you can just be yourself and that's something that he kind of put into the music and there's a lot of stuff that I don't I've got a lot of songs where I'm telling people yeah you can't fuck with me and which was it's that camera there in it yeah you can't fuck with me facts right but at the same time I'm not invincible like, I have vulnerable moments. Like, I'm, just a, I'm a normal human being. So there's, there's going to be times where you feel weak and you feel you can be hurt. And, you, and you're allowed to, like, express that and put that into music. There's a lot of times where you can have fun and just joke and just be yourself. And that's one of the things where I feel like, for me, Ty was the first person that I saw do that. Just go, nah, like, I'm being 100% myself on, on, this, on these, these records. And to me, that was amazing. So yeah, big up time, man. You sure you don't want to shout out anyone who's living? Nah, because there's too many and I'll forget some people and it's but... Is there, if there was one person who really made a difference to you? In, in, as far as you just know, music? Well, just, just in the sense that, you know what? We all wait for people to pass away before we talk about them in that way. So I'm saying, if there was one person that you could just go, yo, thanks for being there, helping and... If we're talking about this, it goes to my parents, man. Like, it's got to be my parents... Like, it's going to be my family, it's going to be my wife, it's going to be my kids. Like, that's as far as it goes. But on the music side, Tom Caruana was the first person to, like, 
give me beats and, and I was recording on his Wicked stuff. Wicked producer as well. Man. Yeah, like that's my guy. So he was like probably the, one of the first people to be like, here's some, here's an, here's an opportunity to have an outlet to do the stuff you want to do. And that was, that was him, man. Yeah. The first time I met you was at a, an event in Flitwick and, and there was a boxing ring. It was different. Yeah, like, I'd never done that before, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And uh, I met you, and I didn't know you at the time and whatever, and I was just kind of wandering around, and I think you met my younger son. Yeah. Like, uh, I had to take him to the back behind the stage and change his nappy and all that. <laughs> that was the first time I met you, and you, you performed. And the first yeah. thing that got my attention was your voice, different. It was different to everybody else. And there was, um, there was a certain energy, you know? And where, where did that come from? I mean, did you have any kind of people that you were looking up to and going, right, I want to sound like them, like your DMXs or anybody like that? Nah, never. Those people were even, a, like, the, my, my voice um, was never... If you listen to, like, my first album, you don't really hear any gruffness with it. It's just, like, I'm just... It's just a young voice. What actually happened was um, when I would shout, it would get gruffer, innit? It would just happen. And I was always shouting, on, on especially on stage. And even to this day, I'm always like trying to not do that as much. But um, I went to, I went on tour and I think we did, what did we do? We did like 15 dates at one time and my voice was gone. And so when I went back to record, so when I recorded um, Industrial Revolution, that's when I, I, I noticed, that's just how it was coming out because my voice was gone. But then I was like, I like how that sounds. That's the style I want to do. Because I'm always trying to figure out, like, oh, how do you set yourself apart from everyone else? Like, what's the... You've got to have, like, a... Where's the character? Because everyone's got the characters, but there's, there's parts of you that you need to turn up so you stand out more as a, as a character. So that was kind of, like, the thinking behind it. And then, even with, like, on stage, my, my thing has always been... We've had these conversations, like, with my brother way back in the day about when you're on stage you need to make sure that you're taking up as much of the stage as possible. You need to make sure you're as animated as possible or, or whatever it takes, whatever the song dictates. If it's, a, if it's a quiet song, then making sure you're showing that emotion through it. So you show whatever the song's emotion, you show that on stage. And so from then, I've always been somebody who's like used to performing. Yeah, like I said, my dad's a preacher. I used to watch my dad on stage every Sunday. My dad is one of the best public speakers like he's amazing as a public speaker super like natural again he's, he's, been, he's been doing it his whole life so I've always watched that so again come up in the church I used to sing in church I used to play drums I know how to be on stage so all of that comes into it and when people are seeing you or coming to watch you your job is to is to captivate them so what I would do again when I first started getting into into the music thing I would watch certain people and see like, what did they do? Fallacy was one of the first people I watched on stage and was like, his presence is nuts. Like to me, that was crazy. Like watching Fallacy perform was like, that's like cool. I need to be more like that. Skinny Man was another one. Watching Skinny on stage. I think one time I was at a show and he jumped off the stage. Every show you've ever seen me and I jump off the stage. That's because of that. Like, I saw Skinny do that. Um, Ty was another one. Like, I remember watching Ty perform and being like, again, just how are you um, transferring this emotion to the people that are watching you? And that all comes in. It's all, it's all down with, like, your voice. How do you rap? And if you notice, there was a, a, a... I felt like a lot of people started taking that. A lot of people started using that style. And then I just switched it. And I went super quiet. Because then I'm like, if everyone's loud... I'm going quiet now. Go wherever the noise isn't. A hundred percent. I need my lane, man. I need I need my lane, and I need like you to. I've got to cut through the noise, and sometimes by cutting through the noise, you have got to be quiet. Sometimes when everyone's quiet, then you got to be loud, and it's just it's just figuring that out. What can you do to make yourself unique to to the listener and understanding, especially with live performances? I've always been a person who's I'm trying to be the best live performer, like and. Bearing in mind, a lot of times it's just me on stage. It's no one else, it's just me. But I always want it to be like, when you leave the show, no matter who else was there, you're like, nah, who was that guy, man? Like, yeah, that, nah, he was, he was cold. And I've been in situations where I've done shows and had people crying, like, 
And to me, that's a win. How can I give the, the people like the best experience? So if I'm, if I'm the headliner, I'm going hard. If I'm the, I'm opening up, like we did a show one time. I'm not even gonna say where it was. If I say where it was, it was just bait up, but it was out the country. And what they'd done, they'd put us on first, me and answer. So we're pissed now. We're like, wait, what? That's disrespectful, man. Like, are you going to have us open up? But I was like, bro, what should we do, though? We're just going to tear it down. And we just tore it down. It's one of the things where it's like, oh, yeah, you got to come in after that. That mentality that you're talking about, I can't see how you can be in hip-hop and not have that mentality. Because mm. hip-hop is a competitive sport. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's only, like, in, our, in the early days, everyone wanted to be the best. And mm. as, as humans... We're trying to also make sure that our message gets across and we want to be heard. Yeah. So if you're standing on that stage and you're performing and your message isn't getting across, you haven't done your job. Facts. Facts. And I, and it, I feel like there's, um, there's a theatrical element as well. That's what so I'm saying. when you look at, when you watch like, a lot of stuff I watch is, um, is like um, sound clashes. So when you look at the sound clash, I, used to, I just watch them all the time. I, love, I just love watching sound clashes. Even when I was younger, going to um, Sound Splash in Brockwell Park, just watching... Yeah, all them, all them, something about them I always loved. It wasn't until maybe like maybe a decade ago or five years ago, maybe, now nah, probably about a decade ago, that I figured it out and I was like, this is musical theatre. That's why it works. Same with battle rap. It's musical theatre. It's, it's two men standing in front of each other doing poetry. You're not seeing, you're, you're too in it. You're, you're thinking, oh, I'm just rapping at this person. No, 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 no. You're not rapping to the person. You're rapping to everybody, to everybody else. Everybody, everybody. And, People want to know, like, if you think about who are your favourite battle rappers, let's just keep it UK-wise. Shotty Horror. <laughs> yeah, Shotty, right? But why is, why, is Shotty the, why is Shotty the best? Character, man. A lot of it. He's crazy, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, ridiculous. And, right, and it's like, there's, there's parts when you're watching him where you're like, this guy is ready to kill this other person. No, he's not. He's a wrestler. He understands it. Like, he's a genius when it comes to, to, to theatre to theatrics. And, and when, when I saw him getting into wrestling, I was like, makes perfect sense. Because I'm a wrestling fan as well, and that's what we like about wrestling. We know that the, the fighting ain't real. Same with the battle rap. We know they're not gonna kill each other really. So what is it that makes it compelling? It's what you put around it. Like, and to me, that's, they're the best rappers. And when I'm, on, when I'm making music, when I'm on stage, that's where my brain is. My brain is, how can I make this? compelling for people watching what's the what's the best way what's the most creative way to present what I'm doing the most creative way to present this next song isn't for me to go yo guys this next song is about no one gives a fuck like <laughs> do the song like if you could think of a, a creative way to to, to to introduce it then then do that and the, the most creative way can never be yo this next song I made in, in two years ago, I was in my bed, like, bro, you are boring the fuck out of me. Like, the only people that can get away with that is the Legacy Act. A hundred percent, because they've already proved, like, we already know the song. You have to remember, like, even to now, I've been, I've been doing song, I've been on stage and making music for t 20 years, yeah? And even now, the majority of times where I go on stage, I'm in front of people who have never heard my music. Like, you might have, I don't know, maybe 40% have, but the rest haven't. So you're in front of people who've never heard you. So you telling them, yo, I'm about to do this song. You know the song, Vision. They're going to be like, what? What the fuck are you yeah, talking, we about? talking about, bro? <laughs> like, nah, like make them feel, yo, what you're about to do or how I can, how I can just see all the phones coming out and everyone's calling the Uber in it. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, like, guys, I'm, I'm gone, man. Yeah, hey. we don't care. Like, we don't, we don't care. <laughs> One thing, we, we, we want to be entertained. That's the thing we... We value over everything. People can talk about, it's about talent, it's about this, but nah, we want to be entertained. We don't care how it is, which is why when you look at the, the, big, the big platforms, you look at like World Star and I'm Just Bait and all that, they're not giving you talent or excellence. They're giving you entertainment. And so you've got to figure out if, if this is the world you want to be in, cool, you can be the best rapper or the best songwriter, but make it entertaining. You as, as a person that... I've known for many years. I've always kind of thought to myself, you could have done anything you wanted to do. And it's just about liking what you did, enjoying it, and basically focusing on it. Why did you choose music? 
I didn't even choose it, man. It chose me. Like, it sounds mad cliche. Again, when I'm young, yeah, you have to remember, like, my cousins were older than me. So they're the coolest people, even to this day. Like, my cousin Neil, my cousin Darren, rest in peace, Marvin, like, they're the coolest people to me. My uncle Stephen, they, no one's cooler than them to me, to this day, right? So when I'm seeing what they're doing, I'm trying to be like them. My mum tells me when I was two years old, I wanted to dress like my cousin Darren. When I was two, they even couldn't talk. Basically, it's your surroundings, right? My surroundings, so, yeah. your surroundings. But then you've got your, your parents on the other side of the surroundings. So why choose that? Your parents are never the ones you look up to, as a, especially when you're as a kid. As an adolescent, I, I think it's something chemical. Your, your, your brain is trying to get as far away from your parents as possible. And you're trying to create your own space. So I think it's definitely something biological when you can look up evolution. And that's where it comes from. So... You're not trying to do whatever your parents are doing. I never thought my dad was cool, ever. Now I think my dad's cool as fuck. But when I was young, I ain't trying to watch what my dad's doing. Like, whatever he's doing, I'm going to do the opposite. So I wasn't, when I'm looking at my cousins and what they're doing, my uncle, big up my uncle Henry, like, pulling up in the, in, the, in the cortina with the music blasting out, my auntie Vadney, like, the music blasting out the car. I'm just like, that's what I want to be involved in. So... The, the, the music was definitely like my first, was my first love. So as I, as I became older and realised, oh, this is like a, this could be a real thing. Like I could actually go down this path and this could work. Then I was locked in. I was like, all right, cool. This is what I'm going to do. And then kind of getting the feedback as well. Like writing my first bars, um, big up my boy Abbe. Like, so I'm writing my first raps and they're all right. They're cool. But then I start getting better. And because they were like, some of my friends are rapping before me. And you know what I mean? We'd have a little, we just freestyle. And I'm getting better and better. And then one day I, I spat this verse. I was at basketball practice. I spat this verse. And my, my boy Josh was like, Yeah, that verse is hard. Like, what's that? Is that Mob Deep? I'm like, Nah, that's me. He's like, Nah, you didn't write that. I'm like, yeah, I wrote that. And so in my mind, I'm like, Damn, I might be good at this. And then, so that's, I'm at that age, I'm 15. So from the ages of 15 to 18, I'm just locked into making music and to perfecting the craft. And I'm, I'm freestyling all the time. Um, that's when I start listening to more UK stuff. And then all of a sudden, I feel like sci-fi, millennium metaphors is, is a thing. Like, wait, what? These guys are from around the way. No, that's crazy. Oh, there's a different style of rapping. This, this stuff is more like, it's more about metaphors and similes and it's about patterns now. And we're, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of experimenting with all that kind of stuff. So for me, it was just like, I get, I get obsessed about things. And at the time, that's, that was my obsession. And it just, it just carried on. It's the, it's the only thing in my life that's been constant from a kid, from a baby to now. So would you say that 15-year-old kid, that was the first point you realised, I'm an artist? No, 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 no. I wouldn't even, like, at, because I, at that point, it's just, I really want to rap. So I'm watching, there was a video, um, what video was it? I think it was Nas, um, Whose World Is This? And I'm watching that video and I'm just like, damn, that is, like, this is it. Like, this, this sound, this feeling, that's the thing I want to do. Like, that is... I'm, I'm going to be that. I'm, I'm, I don't know how, but I'm, I'm going to be that. And it might not even have been like that. I was on the path. There was no other, there was nothing else I was going to do. So there's never like, oh, I might do this, I might do that. No, that's what I'm going to do. I feel like if there was an industry in this country, which I personally don't think there is, I think a few people get a look in and everyone else gets kind of stopped at the door. Mm. right? But if there was... Uh, an industry. I think you would have been one of the people that definitely would have gone through because your work ethic is just nuts. Yeah, man. I think there was, I think what the, the issue we had here, there is an industry, but it's like, because it's, because it's small, we got, we, we think of ourselves as like, there's America and then there's England and we kind of feel like we're equal to them and it's like, no, you're, you're the size of New York State, yeah? So you're tiny. But don't forget, there's a lot of people in New York as artists that are in the same boat. Oh, 100%. But again, it's a size thing. So I always feel like, yeah, I'm a big fish in a small pond. And if you scaled me up to the American size, I would be there. But because we're so much smaller, only a few people could really come through. And I feel like maybe the time where I really should have pushed 
with the time I fell back. But then there's also the other side of it, which is basically you can be a small fish in a massive ocean. You know what I mean? And no one even notices you're there. That's true. This, I speak to people all the time. Maybe that's probably one of the biggest things when the internet really kicked off of me going, there's all these artists in America. Like I'm like, you live in New York and you're not big. How is that? Like, that's weird to me. But nah, there's a whole, there's a bunch of rappers who are from Brooklyn, from Queens, from Bronx, who never made it. And to me, that was always like, wait, what, how? How, did, how could you not? Because everyone else is trying to do it as well. Like, it's not easy. Like, there's, there's, they're not gatekeepers, but there's just, there's, there's, there's barriers, there's barriers to entry and there's a lot more over there than there are over here, I would say. You were doing some other stuff, um, shot in. Yeah, man, but I think, do you know what? I feel like around that time, kind of everybody was, and it wasn't like a big deal. It was just like, I just needed a way to, I wanna make music and I need to make money. Like I'd moved out of the house at that time, but I don't want to work for anybody. I don't want to work in Tesco. I don't want to do nothing like that. I want to, I want to live the rapper lifestyle. I want to live the, the artist lifestyle. And what's the easiest way to do it? And that was the easiest way. And even how I got into that was an accident. Some guy come up to me and was like, yo, I've got an answer. So I don't want to sell it. Do you want to sell it? I'm on the way to a party. So I'm like, and, and bigger, Amos can verify this. Terror can verify this. So we're like, on the way to this house party, and I got this ounce, and this is how this is how much of a neek I was, yeah? Bear in mind, I don't smoke either, right? So I don't smoke, I've never sold anything before like that. So I've just got this, I don't, but I don't know if it's an ounce. So rather than just going, he says it's an ounce, chop it up, sell it, right? I'm like, yo, we need to get scales, and wait, like an idiot, like I'm, like, I'm, like I'm Pablo. Like, nah, bro, just sell the thing, what's wrong with you? But, so, gone to this, gone to this house party, and, Broke it down, um, got the skills. I think Amos, because Amos was already, sorry to beat you up, bro. But he was already doing his thing, so he must have, like, gave me some skills. And then, yeah, from then on, it was like, this was just what I did for a little while, man. Um, but I was rubbish at it, because I didn't care about it. It wasn't my passion. Um, it was never, it was never fun. None of it, I, I didn't like any of it. I didn't like, yeah, it, was, it just was what it was, man. But I wasn't good at it. I'm, I'm, I'm much better. I'm a much better business person and rapper. But you had to go through that to recognize that that wasn't your path. It made no difference to where, where I was going. And I knew it wasn't something I wanted to do. And I think, to be honest, it was more clouty than anything. Because it was just, I was just doing it because I was like, oh, that's a, like a, quite a cool thing to do. The person that I know doesn't get easily influenced to do things. It's not even an influence. What it is, I think at that time, I was very, was chasing money more than anything. So I think, what, if anything, what that did, that kind of slowed my music down a bit. Because what happened then was, once money starts coming in, you're more focused on the money. So then when someone says to you, oh, come and do a show, and you're like, for how much? And they're like, 250 quid. You're like, mm -mm, not I doing. can make that in yeah. 10 minutes. Right, so again, so to me, to be honest, it wasn't, it wasn't the best thing for me, um, but yeah, it's, it, it happens, you, you learn. And again, one of the things, I guess the, the biggest lesson from that is never chase the money, always chase the work, and the work should be the thing you love, because the money can be made anywhere doing anything. So there's no point in getting sucked into something where you're making a lot of money, but it's not the thing you want to do. But I was young, man, I was 18, 19 at the time, so it was what it was, it wasn't a big deal for me. Um, I guess it led, it led on to kind of more serious things, but luckily for me, I got in a situation which meant I had to step out of it. How long were you doing that? Um, I stopped when I was, I stopped around when my daughter was born, maybe even a bit before my daughter was born, maybe four years. Okay, so it was quite a, yeah. so in four years, you still consider yourself as rubbish at that? To me, it's like, you don't sell drugs, drugs sell themselves, innit? So I feel like if, you're, if you have a product, no matter what your product is, if you can figure out who your clientele is and then you can figure out how often they're going to want this product and then how you can reach other people through that, 
it's not rocket science. It's not. It's not a hard thing to do. But for me, I was never. I was never that focused on really making money from it. So it was never like, oh, this is going to be my career. Because I feel like if it was, I would have. I would have done it very differently, and I would have treated it very differently. But I didn't really care. I was just like, as long as I had enough money to do what I wanted to do, that was cool. And the only thing I wanted to do at the time was get Pizza Hut every night and Hagen Dazs. So you know what I mean? It's like. Is nothing. I just wanted, I wanted money so that my girl didn't think I was a bum and we could afford stuff. Like it wasn't to me. It wasn't that deep. The way I, I didn't even have a car at the time, so I'm like getting cabs everywhere. Like, you know what I mean? And to be honest, the only reason I made money really is because I'm not a smoker. I don't smoke. So everyone else would make at that level. They're only they're, they're doing it so they can smoke for free. I know people that were doing that, mm. right? And there were friends, close friends and whatever people that I was pretty tight with at some point. And the horror stories that I've heard, yeah. I mean, I never I never got into that life, yeah, but I know people who were in it, right? Mm. I mean, say for example, you got a certain amount, blah, 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 and you're buying it on tick, so you can sell it to give them, if someone robs you, you're yeah. screwed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. now you've got to sell five times the amount to make back the money and you ain't got you're already on tick. You can't get more. A hundred percent. It's it all goes wrong. Yeah, like, man. Do you know what I mean? Next minute, you got people knocking at your door wanting to shoot your kneecaps. A hundred percent. And I think that I think the reason why even I think now it might be different, but I think back then even the reason why we were even now to me it's it's exploiting exploiting kids, isn't it? Because number one, kids aren't good with money. Kids for the most part aren't good with business. They're not good with organizing. And that's all it is. It's literally, can you be organised enough to like do what you need to do? And luckily for me, I'm a very like analytical person. So, like, when I do, whatever I do in life, I'm gonna do kind of to the best of my ability. I'm always gonna find shortcuts. Like that's just my personality. But at the same time, I'm gonna make sure that it's it's dealt with correctly, whereas a lot of people aren't. I'm very, I'm a very cautious person, so I'm never a kind of person who's just working with anybody or just meeting anybody or that kind of stuff. So I've never got myself into any like mad positions. Luckily for me as well, or unluckily, again, I was around people who've been doing this for a very long time. So when it comes to like plugging in with the right people, I had some very good links that I could be, they could get me whatever I needed. So and people that were trusted as well. And then not only that, I was again because of the people I was working with, I wasn't in a situation where anyone was ever going to rob me because of the people that I was around. So it was like, it was a it was a win-win on that situation. But yeah, man, there's been horror stories and there still are where people find themselves in, in, in messed up positions because they're, you're around untrustworthy people, man. That mentality that you had, like standing on streets and doing what you were doing and everything, you took that onto the streets with your CDs. To me, that was way more fun because to me, now you're like in a situation where you're selling the thing that you really want to sell. So now it's a totally different, like, it's a totally different business. Um, it actually started, AC was the person who put me onto that. So AC was already selling CDs for his cousin. His cousin used to do, I think it was... Um, like drum and bass mixes, and they would sell like double CDs, and they would sell a CD for ten pound. So, I, I got I got to adjust for inflation for you not to really understand. A lot of you kids, you won't you won't even get it how mad this is. So it was almost like going up to a stranger and saying, "I've got this music, give me thirty quid," and them going, "Yeah, okay," and that's what he would do. So he would be selling the CDs for his cousin, and then they would bust the money down or whatever. And then we had we had kind of we had rumblings of like other people doing it as well, but for like their own music. So Mike GLC was one of them. So he had like a few people doing it for him. And I think maybe AC might have even worked for for, for Mike for a little bit or sold some CDs for Mike. But then we were like, so this is let me think what year this is. So this is 2005, right? Um maybe just yeah, coming on to 2006, but around 2005. So then we like we're like my album was already dropped, uh, my album's dropped, did what it was doing, but because of issues with the label, they're not giving me any more money. So now I'm like, I need to figure out a way to make money. AC, what are you saying? Could we could we like do this CD thing ourselves? It's like yeah, okay. So we start pressing our own CDs up, 
um, in the cheapest way we could possibly do it. And we start selling our CDs, five pound a CD, and it just takes off, man. And we figure out like where the best places are. We travel up and down the country, and it it it, it starts snowballing to a point where there's sometimes, especially in central London, there might be ten rappers selling their CD. So you might have had you've had you've had have me, you'd have AC Terra. You'd have Zuby, you'd have Shaldo, you'd have uh, Mr. Drastic, and there might be another five others. Evil, Daily. Evil, yeah, like them, their team, right, cool. So everyone's out there. And everybody, like, is making at least £200 a day. Like, everyone. So that's how much money there was. We would go to certain places, do £500 a day. It, it, was, it was just nuts. So that became... For the for the next probably two years, for the next two years, that was that was my job, man. That's just what I did. Went out every day, sold sold CDs, and just kind of got got my name out there. Because I've already been there, so but for me it was different because I was doing vinyl, mm. so it was a lot heavier on the shoulders oh, and stuff. Crazy. Do you know what I mean? Can't imagine that. But when when I when I was doing it, it was just me. There was nobody else. Yeah. So when I saw you guys like. In, in Maidstone and I've yeah, seen yeah, yeah. some other people in wherever I've seen them yeah. and there's like you said there's loads of them yeah so now it's almost like a an epidemic yeah, of, of CD sellers it's funny man it like everything has a boom and a bust in it so I'd say the boom at some of the like some of the like the boom times was the 500 pound days that those were amazing man but was there any rivalry between you and the other sellers that's nah. what I'm trying to get at because no, if you're making two hundred pound a day or five hundred pound a day, they're all making the same, right? So there is someone isn't kind of going, oh well, if he wasn't here, I'd make an extra two hundred. Like I think some people might have thought that, but that wasn't the way it was. So you, it, the way it kind of works here, yeah? even the, the way it works now, I, I think as far as like fans and supporters, a lot of times if someone bought my CD, they're fans of the music, and they'll go, what else is out there? And I'll be like, oh. Yeah, AC and Terra down there. And they'll go, oh, what? They sell music as well? Yeah, yeah. And they'll go and they'll get theirs as well. So there was never really that. The only time we would we would kind of like, if we were in a place, say we we come to Maystone, I think I think one time we came here and Mike was already here. Yeah, that was the day I saw you. Cool. So we were going. Because what happens? So, so we drove down and we parked up, we walked down and we see like two, like, Maybe two black youths both selling CDs, yeah? And we're like, who are these people? Like, we look right at the top and Mike's sitting at the at the top with two girls just chilling. Yeah, he ain't got no <laughs> CDs in his hand, yeah? He's just chilling. And he's like... Boss so, moves. Yeah. So we're like, oh, Mike's here. What are you saying, man? So we got to him. We saying, you good? You here? He's like, yeah, I'm here. All right, cool. We're out. And then we came, then we walked back down and that's when I saw you. So we was out, man. So like, so in, in certain small places, there probably wasn't enough for you to all get it. But we would go like Manchester and you might have like maybe two or three people. Because again, a lot of times it was me and AC or me, AC and Terror. So they're doing their CD, I'm doing my CD. So we're still going against each other. But it, it, one of the things I learned, number one, it's a numbers game. And number two, they never buy the product. They always buy the person. So it's like, how do you talk to people? What's your initial way of like introducing yourself? Like, how do you present yourself? All of that stuff. So these are the things I learned. So I'd, I'd look and I'd, I'd see like how you dressed. I'm laughing because one of them, I'm not going to mention the name, called me up and goes, yo, Blade, I need some CDs kind of urgently. Like, how quick can you get them to me? I'm like, what do you need? Oh, that, that project. I'm like, cool. And he goes, give me a second blade. And he goes, there's these two girls coming past. And he goes, yo, 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 ladies, ladies, do you want to buy a CD? And they're like, no, no. It's like, well, you haven't even seen what it is. And the, and the girls are like, no, not interested. They ain't got no money. He goes, oh, then fuck off. Cool. People used to do that. <laughs> so, but I'm hearing it on the phone. I'm thinking, bro, don't talk to them dumb, like that. The dumbest way. The dumbest way to sell CDs. <laughs> if you've got no game, it's not going to work for you. Yeah? yeah. But if you're rude as well, again, I'm never buying, like, if you're rude, I'm not buying a CD from you. So my thing would always be number one, I'm dressed, I'm dressed smart, yeah, I'm dressed clean, man. I look clean, like. Talking of dress smart, yeah. Give a quick promo to this. Come what on, is this, this? This is my hustle. That's the clothing line. Go and check it out. And yours? Wait, yeah, you can't. This, this, this one you can't buy right now, but 
you can definitely... Actually, no, you can't even get that either. Go to the website, this is my hustle, there's other stuff you can get. Yeah, so like, even how you present yourself. So you would see guys, yeah, who would be like, um, just dressed, mad, trampy, like, hoodied up, just looking like, know what I mean? So I'd come out, man, I'd be a little bit smart and nice, a nice coat or whatever, and you would just see the difference and how I'd approach you. I'd approach you, it would never be a case of, I would never ask you a question that you could say no to. Or, or I'd, it would be, a, I'd ask in a positive way. So like, yo, you like hip hop, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What you got? Yeah, all right, cool, man. So this is my, this is my, my, my mixtape. It's got, got Skinner Man on it. It's got Sway on it. It's got people that they, people have heard of. And they're like, and we have like the music. Oh, you can check it out. Have a listen, man. Or all that kind of like, just being polite. And then they'd be like, oh, do you know what, man? I've got no money in me. That's cool, man. No worries, man. But a lot of the time people will go, nah, sorry, man. I've got, I got, I got no money. Or whatever. Nah, cool, bro. Have a good day. And they go, nah, what you got, man? What you got? What you got? Yeah. And they come back. Yeah. Just because they just like how you dealt with it. Yeah. We hate being sold to, but we love buying stuff. So never try to sell to people. Just, just let, them, let them be aware of what you have. And if you're going to sell anything, you're selling your personality. Because one thing we like, we like cool people. The, the amount of friends that I have because of selling CDs is nuts. You hear that? This is a lesson for anybody out there that's trying to do what these guys did. That's a big life lesson. Right like there. real, like friends I've had to, to this day. The amount of time people message me and go, oh, do you know what, man? I bought that CD off you like 15 years ago or whatever. Or someone hit me the other day and was like, um, oh, where can I get this CD from? And I, I sent it to my band camp. And I was like, oh, did you buy it before? He's like, nah, nah, I didn't buy it. My dad bought it. Because I was a kid. But I remember you, I remember you like him buying it and I've lost it. Like I used to love that CD, I lost it. Can I get it again? And I was like, yeah, cool, man. And I was like, I gave him a, um, I said, I'm going to give you a discount code so you can get it for free, download it for free. He's like, nah, bro, I want to pay for it. I'm paying like £50 pound for the CD, for the, for the download, just because it's off the strength. And like, these are the, the, the relationships that we built in that, in that environment. Because you have to remember, we was out there every day. So I'd be in Croydon, I'd be in Kingston, and you see the same people walking up and down and like, yo, what are you saying? You good? Like, and we just built relationships like that, man. We, we, we built a whole ecosystem around what we did and people would would come and be like yo that cd you bought i didn't think it was gonna be nothing it's cold like what else do you have i'll be like oh like depot road you can go to hmv and grab that what you in hmv yeah yes they are oh, sick cool cool who else is out here oh, ac and terry that what are they good as well yeah yeah they're cold man they'll go grab it or vice versa it's like. amazing how people always have no money until you're nice to them and 100%. Then suddenly the money appears 100 percent. because you know what my money's my money i ain't got no money for no one else but I've got money for things that I want to pay for or things that I like. So it, 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 it changes the dynamic. I could be on my, you know what I mean? My last fiver and that's for, that's for food. But I meet someone and I'm like, nah, I like this person's vibe and they play me something. I'm like, nah, this is cold. And I'm like, nah, I want to invest because again, they're looking at you like, you're just on the street, right? So they're almost looking at you like a busker and they're looking at you like you're on your come up and they can kind of see where you're going with it and they want to be part of like invested in that. The way we look at we look at companies and we're like, oh, I want to buy it low. It's going to be up there. That's the way they see it, which is why to this day they hit me up and they're like, I love to see what you've done. Like I love, like I was there. I, I bought the CD off you. You came up to someone, so you were in this place, and I bought the CD. You were outside this venue, and I like I like to see what you're doing. Like to this day, and I love that. Like that's the, I think that's a thing that a lot of artists nowadays they're never going to get. They're going to miss out on that part because you're not in this, you're not hand to hand with it. You're not really meeting the people face to face where they can really see who you are, catch a vibe of you, grab your CD, go home, listen to it, and have that connection. That's never getting broken. They've met you, that's never get, I, I met Stars P one time. Met him and was like, yo, this guy's cool as hell. Every time I listen to his music now, man, nah, this Stars P, man, he's cool. I met him at one time, yeah. he's cool as hell. Yeah, yeah. I'm listening to his music forever because I've got that connection and I feel like that's a thing that new artists need to try and manufacture or find a way to do it. Obviously, you're doing it online, which is also a way of doing it, but it's not the same where... It's a bit cold. It is, it is cold and maybe, maybe it's like our perception of it. You see what you were saying about like people, you're selling you. Mm. Yeah, a lot of people are just selling a product. True. And... and you know, they're forgetting that, you know, people need to gravitate to a person before they can gravitate to the product in most yeah. cases. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That's yeah. When, when you haven't got a record company pushing you, when you haven't got like major money behind you and all those things, it's just you. 
Yeah. You've got to sell you. Yeah. That's and that's tough, man. And I, and it's funny because in this, especially over lockdown, right? So lockdown mixed with TikTok and people doing music on TikTok and becoming big on TikTok where there's no there's no live shows, right? So you 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 become an artist on TikTok, your song's blown up. As soon as we come back outside, you're a big artist. Now you're in front of people. You don't know how to perform. You've never been an artist. You don't know what you're doing. And we're seeing a lot of that. We're seeing a lot of acts where they got big songs. You put them in front of people. Nothing. Like, oh, I don't. It don't really connect. And I respect. Like you can't expect people to just be amazing at these things. Because another thing you have to remember is a lot of them, they weren't even trying to be big artists. They just wanted to make music and it blew up. And some of these, some of these people don't even have to perform ever. You know, their, their music sells online and that's it enough. Does. Yeah, yeah, so it does. They don't, they don't need to perform. 100%. It's a different way of like, yeah. You have always been this one guy that has never had one thing going on. You've always kind of thought like, I've got to have a backup plan. I've yeah. always got to have a backup plan. You know, how do you, how do you strategize that and organize it so that, you know, you know, like you can keep things moving productively. I don't think it's a backup plan, yeah? I think it's like, I do one thing, I make music, and then there's things that branch off from that. And, I, I, and I'm like, I, was, I say this a lot, I'm not a good business person, but when people want to do business, they know where to find me. So that's why I'm easy to find, you know what I do, and you know what I can do. Let's, let's get, let's work. Um, after selling CDs, you have to remember, MP3s came along and what, what we, we went from selling CDs, well, AC was doing the £10 CDs, we were doing the £5 CDs, then it went to like £2.50 or £3, then it went to £2, then I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm gone, I'm not doing I'm this. Yeah. When we started doing days where we were making £30 a day, I was like, there's no point doing this anymore. It's literally, yeah, we're, we're, we're gone. So then you got to figure out, well, what else can you do with this skill you have? What other ways can you make money from music? And that's when you start getting creative and then you start figuring out some of the stuff you were doing to make this music is valuable. So then you go, what were you doing before? So you were, you're, you're rapping, you're writing. So you're, you can write, you can do, you almost become a copywriter. Um, you're doing graphic design. Okay, that's, cool, you're shooting your own music videos, uh, okay, we can make some money from that. Um, the graphic design, the things you were designing, they can be used for like merch. So there's a bunch of stuff now, you're, you've got a bunch of things that you've learned from doing this one thing that's now valuable to others. And then you realize the way you value it in your, the way you value it in your sector, in what you do, other people value it very differently. So for you, Writing a song might be worth to a record label, whatever, but to an advertising agency is something totally different. So then you go, All right, I'm not do I'm working with them lot because they value it very differently than what what you value it at. And yeah, that's kind of just how it went. Me just figuring out this stuff that I've learned is value is is valuable. But it's also knowing how to sell it. It is, but that comes from selling CDs in the street. Yeah. It, it but comes what from... What I'm saying is you would know that, but many people wouldn't. They'd have this brilliant logo, this merch, whatever, but they don't know where to go and get it shifted. Or they just don't have the the hustle. From selling the CDs, it's a numbers game. So you might get 100 no's, but you're going to get the one... You're going to get the one yes. But imagine getting that one yes that ends up being the guy that can sign you to a major deal. and That's kind of where how it goes. So, again... What will happen is you'll see that whoever you're talking to, the person comes up to them and, they, and you go, you want to buy a CD? They go, no. Oh, fuck off. And they get all down about it. Right? No. That's the, the no's cool. The no is fine. You don't want it. That's cool, man. Because I know the yes is coming. And all I've got to do, to, if anything, let me get rid of the no's quicker because then I can get to the yes. So it, it's about, when it comes to, then when it comes to business, it's about figuring out, just asking. The, I've got this idea. And there, there are people that I know that do this stuff. I'm going to say to, I'm going to, I'm going to approach them. Hey guys, I've got this idea. I think it could work. They're going to go, nice. Yeah, nice. Okay. But it's not for us. And instead of going, oh man, I'm going to go, it's a numbers game. I'm going to move. And, and I'm, I'm also going to remember 
It's not the product, it's me. So when I go, when I go into these meetings, the, the number one thing I'm selling is me as a person. Like, how, how, does, that, how does that work? Um, I think it was Ice-T who tells a story about when he, got, when he got, his, got, got his record deal and he'd never rapped before, but he knew he could do it. And then he goes, he goes listen, well, if I, if I sell you a grenade, are you going to test it out and see if it works? No. And then he goes, he goes, then the guy goes to him like, that's a, I, I like the analogy. He's like, have you ever like done record deals before? He's like, no, but I sold grenades. Like, <laughs> I, I tease the man when it comes to storytelling, man. He really he's is. like, he's, he really the, he's the guy, he's yeah. that guy. If you're not following IST, go and follow IST on Instagram. So many stories and yeah. the way he thinks like, he, again, he's one of those guys. So that's the, that's the mindset I have when I, when I go into these partnerships and these meetings. I understand that there's, there's value in what I do. Like, I don't look at it like, oh, I just, I'm just a rapper. No, no, no. Let's talk about this value thing for a second, mm -hmm. right? So to you, and don't worry about nobody else, but to you, what's more important, the brand or the legacy? I think the legacy, man. Explain. I think the legacy, because I feel like what you don't want is for one day them to tear your statue down a front in the river. So... You need to make sure that you were doing right by people and that's part of your legacy. So when it comes to business and all this, all this stuff, like making the, making the money and getting the, the stuff is cool, but one day you're going to be gone and what are they going to say about you? And not in, not in like a, a vanity way where they're talking about you and you want to be, nah, man, like the sins of the father, man, your kids got to go through that. I was, I was always... I was always super cool in, in any arena I moved in because of who my dad was or who my family was. Stand up people. So even when I was when I was very young and I'd be moving in the wrong situations, people would be like, nah, that's that's Mr. Bygrave's son, man. Like, allow him in it. Like, yo, 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 big man, you shouldn't even be here, bro. Go get your basketball and go go play basketball. That's what, that's what you're here to do. You shouldn't be hanging with us. Like, we want badness. You shouldn't be on that. Like, we respect your dad. And if we have you hanging with us, we've got to deal with your dad. We don't want to do that. So to me, that's legacy. That's like how it comes down to. And I, I, I want to be in a position where my kids, my kids' kids, they can be like, nah, my granddad, he was stand up, man. Like they did some, they did some cool stuff. And that, that to, to me, legacy means way more than anything. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that one. I agree. Uh, without legacy, the brand is pretty much non-existent. You know what I mean? It's just I think a lot of people focus too much attention on the brand and forget about building themselves. Branding is is important, but it's 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 small, man. The thing is, branding is important when you're a company and you treat yourself like you're a company. Mm. Yeah, but if you don't know how to treat yourself like you're a company, you might as well just focus on your legacy because your legacy will create your brand naturally. A lot of times, because even when we when we do like um, brand consultations and people will have, I was telling you earlier. But I was like, yo, what's 521 mean? Like, you told me what it means, but that doesn't even matter what it means. It doesn't, because not everyone recognizes right. it. Right, yeah, Anyone yeah. Everyone seen it knows it's, it. It's you. Yeah. Like, and so to me, it's like, sometimes we, we don't focus on the, have your idea and have your, your brand, your logo, whatever, but focus on the stuff, because that's what's going to tell us what it is. Because no, we don't know what Nike is. Like, Apple, again, these are simple, these are simple companies and, you know what I mean? Some people that focus too much attention on those things when really you should be focusing on the content you build around it. 100%, which is why this is my hustle. Content, like, it's like, focus on the content. And, and just, just so we're oh, clear, he made me wear this. I did, I forced it. <laughs> <laughs> nah, as, if, as if I could really blame. <laughs> <laughs> we're surrounded in a time where we've got all these distractions going on. Social media is telling you to do something. People are like falling into the trap of social media and trying to, you know, like you, suddenly you've got the whole world dancing at airports and whatever. Mm -hmm. Like we didn't do them things when we were growing up. It didn't exist. Mm -hmm. But now we're in a different time where there's so many distractions. And even the people that are in our age group that you wouldn't expect to get caught up in that are getting caught up in that. Like, you know, it's like you're watching, I don't know, a Bruce Lee film. Right, you know, I'm into my martial arts. You're watching a Bruce Lee film or something, and then all of a sudden you see like six kids doing some dancing in front of an elevator in the airport. Right. You know, and it's like, oh, I wonder what that is. Right. It's like it's so easy to get caught up.
But do you get caught up in that? Nah, because to me, I'm always like, certain stuff is for you, certain stuff isn't. But a lot of people don't know how to differentiate though. They just go for everything that's visible to them. I don't even, like, to be honest, I'm not even mad at that. Like, even when I say I am mad at it, I'm not really. Like, when I've, I've said stuff about people doing the TikTok dancing and it's like people doing mad corny stuff. But even with, like, the corny stuff, I feel like in this day and age, yeah, the, if the corny stuff is going to get you to where you want to get to, then do the corny stuff. But how do you feel about all these people that are doing the corny stuff and getting more exposure than people like you that have spent years crafting your skills? You've been to the Shaolin Temple of Rhyming, bro. Yeah, but, like, to me, that's, that's like... That's cool. It's okay. Because there's certain stuff that's for me. Like we just said, legacy. To me, legacy is more important. Right? So I've, I've, I've said this many times and maybe like I've said it to my wife and I've said it to my kids before. I was like, if I want to go viral and want it to blow up over like something stupid, I know the path to do that. Then you just pick up one of your kids and throw them off the balcony <laughs> right, or something. Cool, right? it's done. So it's not hard to do. <laughs> cool. So then you got to go, but how does that affect your, your legacy? And sometimes that might not even be the right thing because, again, a lot of legacy is caught up in pride, right? So we've got an idea of, like, it's ego. I won't do certain things because it'll make me look stupid, yeah? And th that's just, that might be something that I can't get away from. When I, when I, like I said to you, when I think about, when I do stuff, yeah, it's, I'm thinking about, even when I say I'm doing it for myself, it's still for my cousins, man. I still want them to see it and go, yeah, that's cold. Yeah, yeah. Right? So this, I'm never going to be out of pocket in a way where I do something and they're like, yo, cuz, were you on? Because if I do something, it, whatever I do, there's going to be a phone call either way. So people, back in like the, 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 the Facebook days where people would be like arguing online or whatever and someone would, get, would go a bit too far over and say something about me, Cuz, who's that? <laughs> Yo, who's that? Nah, bro, it's nothing, man. It's just it's it's online stuff. Yeah, yeah. To, today, today, I was on. I was on. Um, I'm just. I'm just bait. And they put up. A, they put up a post saying about um, Ghana has just made it illegal to identify as LGBTQ, or whatever. Yeah. And I put up a post saying, "Yo, just you know what I mean. Love, big up my people." And someone must have put a post. Someone must have replied to me and was was disrespectful to yeah. me. Someone who I'm not going to mention a name, someone who's not to be played with, went under the, and, and like, said something to them, and then inboxed me and was like, bro, I can't have man, you know what I mean? Yeah, I got man you. can't talk to you yeah, like yeah. that. Me, I'm, I understand that it's, it's, it's jokes, yeah? And like, I don't take nothing online seriously. But these people that are above me, they see things very differently because they come from a different... Yeah, yeah, and they don't really watch what's going online. So yeah, they the don't do way. that. So, yeah. again, so if I was to do something really stupid... Like, me and you could go viral right now, bro. Right, Look, cool. You know how? But that's, yeah, we just start fighting. Like. No, <laughs> no, no. Well, we, could, we, could, we could even start fighting. Should we do it? Or, or we could do something even more stupid. Like, I could, I could knock on the neighbour's door, borrow a couple of nappies, and me and you could run down the street in nappies. Right, cool. Yeah, let's so, do it. And what would happen is... The same people that, that, get arrested. that look at yeah, for real. <laughs> the same people that look that that give me them calls will give yo bro, we damn bro. Yeah, like, what are you yo, running around the streets yeah, yeah. in nappies for? Right, <laughs> because even even with even with certain things when I let things slide, in it because number one, I'm always like, especially when it comes to online, I'm very aware of. I do a lot of youth work, right, and I kind of got to be cognizant of like all, all my kids watch me. I have got to be careful of like what I say and what I do. So. Somebody will say something to me online and I'll laugh it off. And then people who look out for me will call me up and go, nah, bro, you can't even let that slide. And I'm like, nah, it's not that deep, man. It's cool. Like, um, to get serious for a second, when, I think we had this conversation the other day, man, when, to, for, for me, if it's not life and death, yeah, I'm not going to risk life or death for it, right? So... We, we start off things, things can be, starts off as words, right? And we got a disagreement about something. And then someone says something that goes a bit too far. And you're like, you know what? When I see you, then it's on, right? Nothing good can come from that. So there's literally, there's no winner. All that's going to happen is if one of us is going to end up dead and the other one's going to end up arrested. Over what? Like, if, if you then go back, 
you could be sitting in jail. Like, what are you in for? Yeah, I had to deal with, man. Over what? Yeah, yeah. A Facebook post. He, he said something on IG. So now my kids ain't got no dad. And I'm in jail now. The money stops. House is... Got, like, like, over... Like, really? Nah. So online, call me whatever you want. I'm pussy, man. I'm pussy. <laughs> it's just not worth it, is not it? Not at all. And, and even, even, even offline, like in real life, yo, it's on. Nah, it's not on. But, nah, you also, you got it. but you also got to realise like a lot of these people that are online, you don't really know who they are. You don't no. know their personalities. No. You don't know if they've got a screw loose. 100%. You don't know if they've got insecurities and 100%. their insecurities, they're tackling that as a way of dealing with their insecurities. Yeah. You just don't know. 100%. And it's never worth it. Yeah. Like, it's never worth it. Like, there's literally, there's no way I'm ever going to win from, from us getting in, in an altercation over, over whatever. That's it's never going to work. That's the wise way. Yeah, yeah, so it's cool. It's like, yeah, you cut me up in the car. You want to swear at me? Cool, man. Get here. Crack on with it. Because for, for me, I'm, I'm focused on other things, man. I'm not trying to like, yeah, that's... I've seen so many people's lives disappear and just go off that decision that they made because they, they thought it was fine. They thought it was cool. It was just a fight. It was just, what, what are you talking about? Da -da -da. Bang! Guy hit his head on the curb. He's dead, dead. Now you're in jail. Man's in 25 years. Of, over what? One punch. Even if the beef is like... Man, I don't know if I can tell this story, man. But one of the one of the last kind of like real beefs I had um, was with a guy, and me and another guy who's also who, who's 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 passed away. Um, but I found out that this guy I had beef with. He passed away as well, and I wasn't happy. I wasn't. I didn't. I didn't feel. Yeah, cool. You got what's coming to you. I I felt sad because I was like. Our, our issues really went over nothing, man. Like, they really went over anything. And we really wanted to hurt each other. Like, we weren't, we weren't playing. Like, the, we weren't playing games. We were coming for each other. And if we had done it, none of us, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be here. Know what I mean, now, I, I definitely wouldn't be here. But now he's not here. And I don't feel like, yeah, I won this one. It's like, nah, it's like, over what? I, don't, I, I want you to live your life as well. Like, I want you to have all this stuff. Me, me I, I see life very simple. It's about views and food. You're gonna, you want to go see some good views and have some good food. I want to see all the different countries. I want to eat all the different food. That's what I want to do. Explain that views again, because everyone else instantly would have thought you're talking about Instagram views. Nah, 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 nah. nah. Views. views, like, I want to see the beach. I want to see sunsets. I want to see mountains. I want to see temples. I want to see art galleries. Like, I want to see architecture. I wanna, that's what I want to see. I want to go to these places and sit down, see these things, and while I'm doing that, have some good food. That's kind of like, when we go on holiday, that's what we do. Some people that I know don't even know that life exists outside of their own area. 100%. Like, luckily, I was, I, was, I was blessed to be able to move around and see other things, and music has kind of helped me to do that. But I don't just want that for me. I want that for everybody. There's, you can't... There's not enough hate in me to, to have hate in my heart for you to not see that. And again, if it's not about life and death, and I don't even like talking about this stuff online because I do think it's a bit, it does get a bit corny, but like, unless you kill one of my immediate family, then it's what are we talking it. about? Yeah, exactly. like, I can't it's care. It. Like, it's, it's, it's literally whatever. I want, I want the best for you. And you know the story that you just said, the sad thing is that you never got the opportunity to kind of just make up. And squash it. Well. Yeah. That's what we would have done. We would have squashed it. It would have been nothing. I would have seen him. I'd have been like, yo, what are you saying, man? Like, we were bugging. Like, it's, it's, it's really nothing. It's really, it's really nothing. And I'd say, like, a lot of some, of, some of my closest friends come from, we had beef one time, and then we squashed it. They're, to, I'm going to be real with you, they're some of my favourite people, man. Because it's almost like we've, we've experienced something different. I can't explain it, man, but it's like, yeah, we used to hate each other, but we had a disagreement. But one of us decided to be the bigger man. Yeah, like yeah. whatever, man. I don't really, I, honestly, I don't care. I want you to be good. You want me to be good. Be good, man. Your career, what's the, how many years has it been now? About 20, something, 20. 20. Yeah, I'll say 20. Yeah. I think like my first release was uh, 2003. So. Okay, so it's just, just over 20. Yeah. Um, and how many albums and singles have you done? Just so people get an idea of the work ethic I was talking about. There's loads, man. I, 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 honestly, I can't tell you a number. On, if you go to my band's camp, you can see like all the releases. 
And that's just like my stuff. Then I then there's loads of features. I remember the one year I did like sixty something features. So there's like a lot of music. Out yeah, there. That, that was my next question. How many features? Because nah. you you've lost. Because I lost count. I stopped doing features for probably a couple of years, man. There's a couple of years where I just weren't doing features. I just I'd said no to everybody. But I think I did like this week. I think I've done six. Okay, wicked. Yeah. Anything we should look out for? Nah, nah no. Nah. So it's all gonna flop. Yeah, it's gonna flop. Yeah, yeah, it's all gonna flop. Don't, don't I've got some. I've got, out, <laughs> I've got some big, some big stuff coming, man. Like a lot of a lot of stuff with um with drama base and uh, drama base producers, um, couple of garage tracks. Yeah, like some. You'll 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 see it, man. You'll see it. One thing that's always impressed me about you is that you have managed to get a lot of things done without actually being famous. You're well known. Like when when I was in the charts, people were going, "Oh, he's famous." I'm like, "No, no, I'm I'm known." I'm not even well known, I'm just known. But you, um, you've done things like, you know, you've had adverts on buses and I don't know, and you've done a lot of voiceover stuff yeah, as well. Yeah. Adverts on TV. I did the first the first um joint terrestrial advert, which was so it was channel, it was BBC, ITV, Channel Four, and Channel Five in history. The first time they did a project together, I did the voiceover for that. Um so that's kind of historic. Um Done some, yeah, done some pretty big, big adverts. Been in some big adverts. Um, I, the, the Magnus Irish Cider was a, was a big one for me. Um, so I've done, yeah, like done some stuff. Had my face on buses and trains for That was most mad. Of, when I saw that, year. bro. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was like, so yes, bad. Jen, go ahead. I, I had not, I went into that not knowing what it was going to be. So literally just turned up, did, did, the, did the, sh the, the, the shoot. And it was only supposed to be up for a couple of months. Because it, it was a really big, like, it's a, it was a really big campaign. Um, and it was up for way longer than I thought it was going to be. So I'd, people were sending me pictures every day. Every day for, like, six months. Well, maybe even longer than that. People were sending me pictures. Yo, this is you on a big billboard. I was driving to, um, to Stratford one time. Driving past the thing. And it's this big light-up light up post of me in front. I was just like, what the hell? That's crazy. But, yeah, like, it was... It was cool. I liked it because it was kind of like the petty side of me was like, if you hate me, you got to go to work on public transport and see my face every day. Every day. I now, love that it? shit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was like, it was, it was, I've been very um, fortunate to kind of get these opportunities. How did you get that? So what had happened was the company, um, Turo, had, um, so this is my version of events. I don't know all the ins and outs. This is what I've heard. So they had a, um, a campaign ready to go and they spent a lot of money on this campaign. So they've got the, the ideas back and they're just like, we don't like what you've given us. We don't like this idea. So now the director um, who's in charge of the marketing has to come up with another idea. That guy happens to be a family member of mine. And also the person who's doing the styling is also a family member of mine. It's her birthday today as well. Happy birthday, Bethan. And um, happy birthday, Bethan and Lily, actually. Nepotism. Yeah. So, so they're like, can you, can you do it? Like, like and I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Like, I've and never they done... explain what you had to do? The way it was played, it was just a photo shoot. And I've done those loads of times. Yeah, so I'm yeah. like, yeah, cool, I can do a photo shoot. Nothing. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, turned up, did the photo shoot, met the other models. Um, super cool. Like, it's a really good shoot. Everyone on the team was really cool. Um... It was actually shot on the same roof where I did my my DMB All Star mic a little while after that as well. So yeah, um, it was cool, and so it was done. Didn't think nothing of it. Then they showed me the the the, the, the pictures when they were done. I was like, oh, they look cool, man. Yeah, wicked, cool, 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 cool. And then they were like, yeah, it's gonna be on like um like trains and stuff. Cool, okay. Goes <laughs> up. I'm like, oh, that's sick. That's cool. Then it just starts going everywhere. Was it just London centric or was it all over? It was just London, but then there was a few, I think there was some in Manchester. So I'm assuming one in Manchester. So it, it, got a, it got around, but yeah, everybody was hitting me up. My cousin came from New York and she's, she's I'm taking a picture of a uh, Big Ben and then the bus goes past. And I was like, that is the coolest thing ever. So I pinned that to my IG. That's, I don't think I ever taken that down. To me, that was amazing. Like my wife, she's at Oxford Street. She got a picture of it. In all the years that I've known you, that was the happiest moment for me, for you. Well done for that. Yeah. No, I appreciate that, it, man. Was sick. Appreciate and it doesn't matter how you got it, because you know sometimes it is who you know rather than what you know, and it doesn't mean like just because you know them, you had to deliver. 
A hundred percent, man. Like that's I think um somebody well, I think it was DJ um EFN and he said um nepotism is a new generation of wealth. And if you think about like what the way all our industries are, that's how they were all built. So you can't hate on any of them. It's just like that's just the way it is. And I don't think it's even I don't think it's even a bad thing. It's just like you're gonna you're gonna mess with who you know, innit? Tell us about Wembley Arena. That was nuts as well, man. That was like that was a little while ago now. That's like 2016, I think. Um, got a phone call saying, "Yo, do you want to perform this song?" I did this track um, for Matt Goss, and it's like a remix. And they were like, "Do you want to perform it?" And I was like, "Yeah, okay, cool." They're like, "Yeah, it's gonna be in Wembley on um, Saturday." I'm like, "All right, cool, no worries." They're like, "Oh, can you come down for a sound check?" Yeah, cool. Where is it? So uh, at the um, it's the, the arena. Like, wait, what? At the arena, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I just wrote the song, that, like, probably like two days before. So I didn't know none of the bars, anything. It was like crazy. So I've gone down. Um, I've met uh, Matt Goss and his team. Everybody was like really cool. But I've like, because I've only really gone for a sound check. So I'm not even dressed. I'm like in a tracksuit, like <laughs> looking mad bummy, yeah? Just like rolling in. And, but I met all the team. Everyone was cool. Um, one of the things which was crazy so yeah and I'm just just me like I've gone and got uh, my after the sound check when I got went back got my wife I'm at this time this is 2016 man I'm still driving a Peugeot man I'm whipping in a Peugeot right so I've come back um, big up Bo Courtney because Bo Courtney was the one who got it, he put it, he put it together um, so yeah rest in peace Dave Courtney as well so we're there it's me Dave Everyone's just chilling and like Dave is there, they, these bare celebrities. Like all these, like all these Melanie Psych, all these celebrities that you see, I'm just like, and they're all going, oh, we love what you did, did it? Because they saw the sound check. And um, the, yeah, it's crazy. And then so like, before I go on stage, they've got a, um, a choir that, that's backing up the band. And one of the guys I know from the choir, one of my boys from way back. So I'm like, yo, we did it. He's like, we did it. I'm like, I'm about to go on stage. He's like, wait, what? You're on stage? I'm like, yeah, bro. I'm like part of the part of the show. He's like, dad, that's crazy. So I'm backstage and I can't see the crowd yet, but I can hear it. The, the show hasn't started, but I can hear. And just the talking, the level of like just people having conversations of 12,000 people is nuts. And I'm just like, all right, just, just, just take this in, man. So show starts. They're like, you ready? Genesis, go, go. So I go on stage, live band by the way, yeah, it's a live band. So they start doing it, it's my part to do the verse. I mess up my lines, right? Cause I, cause I, I, again, I didn't know the verse. Like I, it takes me a while to learn verses. I'm not learning the verse in two days. So I've messed the verse up and he's just given us, Max has given the signal to run it back and the band's just run it back again. And I've gone in and I've messed up again, but, I can freestyle, bro. So I freestyle and I'm just like bigging up the crowd and stuff and bigging up and it, it's better than the verse I wrote anyway. And everyone's going crazy, yeah, like going mad. So I'm just like, yeah, it was so sick. Come off stage and um, after the show, one of the things, I, one of the things I, I, I learned from that is like, I was like, that level of fame, I don't ever want. Like it's too much. Bro. Is Sorry, it? I can relate to that. Because you can't... The fun goes. Proper, it's, the fun is gone. But yeah, so like I did that and I've come off stage, said goodbye to everybody after the show, driven out in my little Peugeot. As the gates have opened, there's bare fans all just waiting and they see me, they're going crazy, right? I'm just there on my little Peugeot. They're like, ah! <laughs> I get home, my, my Twitter... Gained like 300 followers, like straight away and then kept going up over the time. And some of those people, again, are still fans to this day, still message me. Um, um, there's a woman, Catherine, who's like probably the nicest human I've ever known. She's just love and light, just like a real genuine person. And she like always buys like my merch and stuff. And the last thing when she, um, she bought something and I sent her the all access pass that I got on that day. And I was like, this is for you, oh, yeah, you can have that. Because she's like a really big fan of his as well. Like, obviously, she's like, that's why she was there. And um, yeah, it was like a, it was like a, 
a really good experience, man. It was, it was so, again, it's like Wembley Stadium is a place that not everyone's going to get to perform at. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's a bucket list thing, innit? So, I've done it, bro. So yeah, I'll all right, cool. On that one. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're in, 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 we're greatness right here. I know what you're going through because believe it or not, I actually fucked up too. Yeah. The <laughs> same reason I didn't know my lyrics because they just Same. dropped it on me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it so, was too much, thing. man. Yeah. Like, the, I think some. I think one of the things I learned as well from then is like, be prepared in it. Like, be prepared. Yeah. And just do what it takes. Yeah, but it's to hard to prepare when they're giving you two days notice. It is. It and is. you're in another country flying back, and you ain't got nothing. To be honest, it was a it was a mad one because it was like, I had to. I'm. I've just re- just written it, and I'm trying to learn it. But I've got other. I'm working. I've got other stuff to do, and I'm like. You know what I mean? I've got it in my headphones going back and forth and I'm trying to get it and it's like, yeah, I just didn't have, an, I didn't have enough time but I can freestyle, man. Going on to more big things as well. Then you had the mobile one sung. Yeah, that was sick. Like, I mean, we could just wheel off a whole bunch of things that you've done, bro, but let's, let's just keep it to a time limit as well. So, yeah. mobile. Just big up the mobiles, man. Big up Kanye King. Like, she's given me a really good opportunity to just be part of this industry and kind of see it from different from a different angle. Um, yeah, man, I, th- I think like, obviously being an artist and being an independent artist, you're just doing everything yourself and you're always on the outside. Um, Mobile Unsung is really an artist development program. So when I got through that, um, like winning that competition and then getting through and then getting a job um, with Marshall from that kind of allowed me to see the industry from a much wider or broader spectrum um, and just kind of get a better understanding of how things work and why things don't work for most artists. So, yeah, man, it's a, it's a, it's a sick. I li- like just the mobile as an organization. I think is important. Going to the mobile, I didn't go this year, but I went the year before, and we was on the, I was on the front table, man, and just seeing you're around some great people, man. You're around people that have really done it, and it, it's very inspiring to just see the people that you see every day on on TV and on these social platforms and achieving these big things, standing next to Kano, you're like, nah, like, some manners don't like me. Ah! It was crazy. Like, you're just around those people. And Joshua came through. I was on the table. He's like, yo, we saying Jen? I'm like, what are you saying, bro? Like, Watford in the house. And yeah, it just, it was, it was definitely one of them situations where it made me just think there's a pathway to this. There's a pathway to like get into these, get into these 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 spots and the top of these platforms. Big up Manga as well. Manga's been nominated for two not two yeah, Saint Hillier. Yeah, yeah, wicked, good guy, man. Yeah, man, like legend out here. So <clears throat> M24 as well was nominated for a Mobo twice. So I think this is his second time as well. So yeah, I think it's, I think we have this idea of what industry is, and we think it's like some big. Illuminati, you can't get into it. But it's not, it's just people who know each other, who like the music and like like the stuff. Like we're industry, it's what we, we are. That's why in that freestyle I said, on a first name basis, they're my mates, like these are people that I know because we've just been doing this for so long. We've become, we are part of the industry now. I remember like, this was, like, wait, THTC just had their 25th year anniversary, but on a 20 year anniversary, I remember being there and I was with my wife and I was like, oh shit, we're industry. Like we, the whole time we've all been like, fuck the industry. Oh no, 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 you are industry. You're part of the, you're part of the fabric that built what this is. You're in a position where you can give opportunities to other people. You're in a position where if you need to get whatever, you can call up certain people because you know them. You used to, you know what I mean? You came up with them. So, I think that's the, the the biggest takeaway from it, man. It's not this this nef, ne, nefarious organization that we think it is. It's just a bunch of people that like music and like being creative. Yeah, and, and all it takes is for I guess one person to kind of embrace you and take you to one of these events, introduce you. Next minute, you're walking down Tottenham Court Road and bumping it. Yo, Mike, remember me? It's like you know, and it, and it starts from there. But there's a lot of people who basically never leave their homes um, and they expect things to happen for them. Yeah. And it doesn't work that way. You've got to go out there and mingle with people or at least have friends who can even introduce you on a phone call to people 
And yeah. do you know what I'm saying? It's conversations. 100%. Get familiar with. But is that why you've got a positive outlook on everything? Because you've been in those situations, so you can see the potential of what's there. I don't think I have a. I don't think I even have a positive outlook. I think I have a realistic outlook, and I think I've been on both sides. So I've been in a position where I felt like the industry was against me, um, and there was this, this this thing of being like the underdog. You're being hard done by. They don't want to see you because you you're too real, man. That's why they don't want they don't want to hear from you because you're too real. It's like no, it's not. There's there's that's not why you're not being heard because you're too real. Like no one out here is too real. It's just because you're just not doing the correct things to be put in those positions. You're not doing the work that it takes. And some of it is pay to play. Like, don't get it twisted. Some of it is simply down, you're not putting your money in. If we talk about um, going back here, you talk about Channel U. Like, none of this is, it's not meritocracy that gets you anywhere. You're not, you're not put in these positions because you're the best. No, you have to pay to be put on these channels. You have to do certain things to get to these spaces. You can't you can't talk about, yo, they're not letting me in the party, man. Where's your invitation? Did you buy one? No. Then why? You, of course you're not going to... They're not just letting you in because... You know what I mean? So there's certain things we kind of got to humble ourselves and go, no, nah, this is just the way it is. Like, you can't... I don't know, man. There's, there's a million examples of why it doesn't work the way you think it does. And for some reason... We think the music industry should be different. It's easy to call everyone Illuminati, isn't it? Yeah, because it's like, oh, yeah, like, now they're hating on me. You have no haters. Some people think you're a prick. That's just life. Like, no one's really, like, literally, when you're out of sight, you're out of mind. No one's thinking about you. No one cares. No one's hating on your music. They're not even listening to your music. They don't care. Bro, should we do... um? Should we do our Illuminati symbol now? <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. go on, do it. I do that. I do that. I do no symbols, man. They already that that my um my other hoodie, my um uh the algorithm is the Antichrist. That's already got people going crazy on me going. Oh, uh, you know what? That was me that told you to do that, innit? That was yeah, 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 it was you. Yeah, it was you, yeah, yeah. Hundred yeah. percent. Like, yeah, made that into a hoodie. And I was like, yeah. yeah. On so, that, yeah, yeah, people been, because I pulled it out fault, of the lyric. Blaine, it's your bro, fault, bro. I, I, I heard the lyric and I was like, yo. And I, I quoted it yeah. and it just went fire. And then you go, you should make a hoodie out of it. And next thing, I didn't yeah. know you'd done it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I should have been wearing, not this. Yeah. I had, you know what? I had one and I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to bring it because it's it's not it's not actually This Is My Hustle merch. It's Genesis okay. Elijah merch. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's fine. Yeah. But I'll, but, get you, I'll get you one. Yeah, 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 you have to get one. Because <laughs> your idea. But like, yeah, when I did the, the idea of what I did, I put... um. Baphomet, but as an AI like robot, you know, it's a sick line though, man. The algorithm is the Antichrist. When I wrote it, like when I said it, I was like, "Damn, you're, you're on." Yeah, something. I was like, "Oh shit, you're yeah. fire, bro!" Yeah, like yeah. that you said something, and yeah. I think even when you mentioned about earlier when you're talking about people doing the dumb stuff for TikTok, that's it because everyone's worshiping the algorithm. You're trying to to get in front of people so you can blow up. I've got to the point where I'm just kind of wondering: has has if there is really a god and a devil? then has God kind of left and gone, you know what, like, you people are too much for me. I'm gone. Let the devil deal with you. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's a whole other interview, man. Yeah. I hope we can get into that. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, but, but I just thought I'd just put that out there. Yeah. You know what I mean? But, yo, what is the importance of music to you? I think music is telling your story. But, like, obviously, like, I think vibe comes first. So I think, like, you're creating a vibe for, like, different environments, right? So what what... I always think about where's my music going to be played. So sometimes I make music to be played in a club. Sometimes I make music to be played on the way home from a club. Sometimes I make music to be played on a beach. Sometimes it's made to be in your bedroom alone. So it's like, it's creating a, creating a vibe and storytelling, telling either your story or someone else's story. So that, I, I feel like not everybody can rap, right? Uh, not everybody can paint. But you can look at a painting and go, yeah, that's amazing. Like, I wish I painted that. There's, there's a whole bunch of people out there that can't write music, but their stories want to be told. And that's what, to me, that's what music is there for. It's like, how is this, how is this story told? How does it make you feel? And it's, it's a soundtrack for life. Music is powerful. Yeah, like, music might be the closest thing we have to, like, um, documented spirituality when you think about it like the amount of people that actually reference music and 
go to artists and records and whatever. It's like, you wonder how many people are reading the Bible, how many people are reading all these books that are supposed to put us on the right path, but yet everyone's quoting Kanye or Jay-Z or whoever. I personally believe that you haven't achieved what you should have achieved, yeah, right? I'm and I and I think that's basically probably in my in my mind it's a fair assessment to say that you deserve much more, right? And I, I feel like if you had a face that was recognized, um, then you would be in a whole different place because a lot of time people just look at someone and they maybe don't recognize them, mm. and then they, the opportunities don't come. Now I think you missed a trick there because you did a video called "Watch What I Do," yeah, right. And there's segments in that where you could have passed off as exhibit. <laughs> and you missed a trick there, bro. <laughs> you could have told everyone you were exhibit. I thought you was going to be just... I was like, where are you going with this? <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm been, telling you, I've you been could exhibit. have just gone. People that could be exhibit, they could be method man when I was younger. <laughs> Who else have been? I've been Ice Cube. Yeah, man. They've been, they've been calling me all these different... No, but that things. exhibit, man, it's like... Seriously, I, I was watching the video the other day as a reminder because I comment, commented on it years ago. Yeah. And I was watching it again. I thought... Me, he looks like an exhibit. <laughs> you know what I mean? So nah. you missed the trick, bro. You could have told everyone you were exhibit. Could have, man. You know I mean? could have. But I think going back to what you're saying, yeah, like what you I feel like you always already have what you deserve. Like you you've you've already got what you deserve. So I never feel like I deserve more, but I do definitely feel like I'm going to get more. And age doesn't matter. No, nah, not matter. in this not like, in this day and age. Never. Nah. Never. Like I I think it's a I don't know, man, it's it's a it's a Maybe inbuilt into us that we got to do things in a in a certain time frame, but the more I look at history, like age is like that's not the factor for you to do great things. I think um, Joan of Arc was like twelve when she started her madness, and you know what I mean. We see people at much older ages doing things as well. So it's really just like it's when you figure out your path and you figure out how to gain traction on that path. That's when it's going to come together for you. And obviously there's a bit of, I wouldn't say luck, but timing is important. Um, timing is important. And for you to just understand the knowledge. And not only that, man, like, you don't know the thing that's going to be the, like, the spark. You don't know what it is. Like, I might think it's rapping, yeah? Joe Budden thought it was rapping. It wasn't, it was podcasting. So you don't know the thing that's going to be like, oh, that's what gets you to where you're trying to get or, or what gets you the recognition. It might not be me. It might be my kids. My kids might do something. Like, to me, I've said it many times, man. Like, I've got two daughters. I've already been born again. So I might do, this might be as far as I get, as far as, like, success. This might be all I do. They might, even, they might over there. It might be their grandkids. Their grandkids blows up and it's like, yeah, that's what, that's what I was here to do. Like, that's how, how, it, how it played out. So I feel like your, your priority has to be what makes you happy? Like, where, where do you find your happiness from? Like, what's the, the stuff that you love? Like, just, just focus on that. Because if you, if you keep focusing on trying to chase these different goals or trying to chase success, your, what will probably happen is you won't get it and you'll end up bitter. Don't do that. Just, if I never make it in any bigger in rapping, please know I had so much fun making this, making this shit. Like, that was the, that was the prize. Before you ever heard the songs, I was already loving it. I was already loving life. I was already fully gassed. Me and my wife have already listened to all these songs that you, you ain't going to hear yet. We already listened to them together. I'm playing her this. Yo, check this out. She's like, oh, yeah, I like that. Like, play it to my kids. Yeah, that's cool. That's, like, we already, we already, I already won at that moment. Every, if anyone else likes it, it's a bonus. Yeah, cool. You like it as well? Okay, cool. From a lot of the stuff that I was hearing, you were doing a lot of aggressive rap. You've then gone and changed your sound a number of times yeah. where you kind of, at, at some point you started bringing in choruses that you normally wouldn't have done in the early days. Yeah. So, so I'm guessing that was a strategic move to try and dumb down the music a little bit so you got to more, like, because me personally, I feel that if you really want your music to work, it's got to appeal to the women. Yeah, 100%. I've said this, I've done this many times, L label consultations, artists, if, if any of you are watching this, you know I've said this a million times to people, like, Make music for the women because men don't men don't react to music the same way women do. Um, you won't see you, well, you won't see me at front stage of a concert screaming till I faint. 
We just don't, we don't, we're not fans like that. We don't love anybody like that. It just doesn't, that's just not in us. We might do that at football maybe, so maybe sports side, but as far as like music, we ain't, we ain't doing that. So for me, making music that women relate to, you're going to have a, a much stronger fan base. You're going to have a much better connection because women just have a, a better way of like connecting with music. The way they feel, feel about music and artists is a different level. And us, we just go where the girls are. Someone calls me and says, yo, we're going to, going to a rave or whatever. Like, is it a sausage fest? Is it is? Drop me out. Right? So we don't even, I mean, we don't care who's there. Like, who, who's going to be there? The girl's going to be there. All right, cool, we'll turn up. So that, and even if you think about, like, going back to my teen days, my young days, music that was, that was, people put me onto certain music. It's like, it's the, it's the girls. They're the ones who come in with, yeah, have you heard this? Like, that's just what it is. So I, I feel like that's much, and it, even if you don't take my word for it, just listen to your favourite artists and the biggest artists and just see who they, who they cater for the most. Look at Kendrick, Drake, and uh, who's the other one, J. Cole. And I think that's one of the problems that we have in UK hip hop because when you go to events, the only people you see at the events generally, if it's organised by themselves and whatever is their friends, other MCs, there's hardly any girls. Uh, when I say hardly any girls, there's literally two. None. Um, you know what I mean? And, you know, one of them is bound to be Sammy J. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, she supports everything. Yeah. Really, really good person. And then Jazz Kaina. With UK Hip Hop, if you think about who we were making music for, we were making music for each other. So, we're, we're ri I'm writing because I'm trying to impress Kalashnikov. I'm trying to impress Chester P. I'm trying to impress Skinny Man. So, that's what I'm writing for. I wasn't writing for no girls. I was literally writing for the man them. So that's where it was. And, and you see like, with those kind of genres, same with grime as well, yeah? With, with traditional grime, there's quite, a, there's a ceiling with it where it kind of hits. And then when you see it change is when you see people being more, um, I love you, you, whoa, what, what happened there? Talking about a girl. It doesn't even matter, it doesn't even matter how you talk about women. But you're doing it. 100%. Yeah. So that's where it, it changes and they figured out Oh, there's a there's an element here. There's a way we can do that. In UK hip hop, we never we never got that. We never we never did that. I think the closest we get is like dreamy days. But dreamy days. You're never hearing dreamy dreamy days, days in the club. Yeah. So then Sick tune though. Right. One of the probably like for me that's my favorite Wiz Maneuver tune. I might be with you. Yeah. Like it's it's incredible. Just reading the reading the room, man. Seeing like what what works and then and then with me it's been a, it's been kind of like. Just, just trying things, just trying it, like, f like really thinking, who is this song for? Who do, when I'm on stage, who, who do I want to see? And that's kind of like the, what the, the switch has been. And that's kind of where you see the, the numbers have started going up and that's where they went up from when I started making music for other people other than just, just literally me and the guys in, in the room with me. Yeah, so you get to a point where you reach that ceiling and you think like, you know, I still want to make music. I love music, but this ain't it. This ain't doing what I needed to do mm. or the enjoyment is gone and, you know, I'm sick and tired of performing to the man them and mm. whatever else you want to call it. So then you start kind of putting your foot into the drum and bass scene. Yeah. So first of all, how many record deals have you had in your career? Uh, only three. Okay, who were they with? I've had album deals and single deals. So my first was with Broken Souls um, and Dominant Third. So those were like my first, that was Depon Road and Jar Bless. Um, and then since then, I've had no, I've had, I've had single deals obviously with, um, with V Recordings. Um, I've had stuff out on, on a DJ Zinc's label, Bingo. Um, which actually I think is, is kind of hard because like my first year of doing drum and bass and garage, I had late songs out with the biggest labels or for me, the most respected labels in that field. Um, I've had, I haven't had an official release for Hospital, but I've had stuff with Hospital, Hospital Records. And Hospital Records is probably the biggest drum and bass label. Yeah, around, yeah. Right? So. Yeah, man. I probably could have got some single deals before, but I wasn't, I just wasn't aware of the process of how to do it. I wasn't aware of how to set up meetings, 
um, I didn't understand where distribution was important or publishing was important. So there's a lot of things that I had to kind of learn that I, I've only really learned in the last probably two or three years. So yeah, so it's it's a, it's been a it's a learning process, and I think if I had got a record deal earlier, it probably wouldn't have done what it, what it was supposed to do. Because I think I would have I would have seen it in the wrong way. When you get the opportunity to kind of swim in that ocean and then it doesn't work out, then you start maybe questioning yourself: Am I the right artist? Am I this? Am I? And next minute, it's like if you believe you are the artist, then the only people that you can blame is the rest of the world. Forget the business practice, the way it works. But if you look at like the amount of people that are signed to labels or even, forget even albums, just singles that are signed to labels that don't do what you think they should do. There's so many. And I'm a person, I, I really watch the numbers. So I'll put my single out independently and I'll watch someone who's signed and see what theirs does compared to mine. And a lot of times I'll do better than them. And not only am I doing better than them, all the money's coming to me anyway. So I'm, I'm winning on all, different, on all different fronts. But I think part of the problem is when you're signed to a label, this is the analogy, right? The label is the car that picks you up and it's gonna bring you to your destination. And you think all you gotta do is get in and just sit back. You don't realize, nah, use a lot of work. You gotta wash the car, you gotta, you might even have to drive. Like, yeah, you got the vehicle, but you gotta drive it, you gotta put petrol in it, like you gotta make sure the tires are pumped, you gotta do so much work for it to work. Whereas what happen again, what happens is people get signed and They'll make their music and they'll give it to the label and they think the label is going to do whatever they want. The, so many times, the label are going to have the music and they're going to be like, all right, you ain't even hot enough for us to put it out. We don't want to waste our time with this. So get hot. But you're thinking the label are going to get you hot. So you're like, I don't know. What am I supposed to do? You, there's, there's so much information that you don't have on, on how this works. And you're just in a lose-lose situation, which is why most deals don't work. Even the ones where you've got a viral hit, right? So you've got a song, your song hit, hits on TikTok. The labels see it. They go, we like this. We want to license it or we want to buy it. And you go, all right, cool. You've never had any money in your life, right? They're going to give you 15 grand. Maybe they, and, that, and that's on the high end. They're going to give you 15 grand. We want that song. What else you got? We're going to option another two. You're like, all right, sick. But you only got one song. So that song's doing what it's doing. Doing okay. They're putting a bit of money into it, but it was already bubbling. They're just pushing it a bit more. You come with another song, you give it to them. They go, all right, we'll take that as well. It don't do what the last song did because it was a viral hit. Like, we don't, we don't know you. You're, like, part of your song just worked. But we don't know you as an artist enough to, to do anything more with that. So then that song doesn't work. The third one that was optioned, now nah, we're good with that, bro. Okay, cool. So now your your songs are your your first song is doing well, but you ain't getting no money from it. They gave you your fifteen grand. How long is that gonna last you? And also on top of that, when you've been in that position and you've had that opportunity and you haven't made it work, others are gonna be more reluctant to work with you. A hundred percent, of course. You know I mean? You're not going to another label's not touching you. Yeah. Because it's like, oh, why didn't it work? Wait, you were signed to so and so, that didn't do anything. Now nah, we're good, we're cool. Like, and you didn't even you you proved that you didn't even know how to make it work anyway. You didn't add anything to it. If money was the if money was the the thing, we would know we'd know how to do it. We'd just go, oh, cool. Just put get get another two hundred grand. That's gonna work, right? Cool. And you just get the next artist, cool. And you just do it. That we have seen so many times that it's not about the money, man. It's not. I've only had, again, the two singles that were put out from other labels is the only time I've had. Um, actually, no, there was another one as well that I did myself, which I got. So I've had three singles funded by other people. Everything else has been self-funded. But I've always made money from music because I know how to make money. So for me, it makes sense. I, I can scale up. So if I'm given, I don't, I don't need to be given 50 grand to make an album work. I can make an album work for 10 grand. One of the deals that you had was we is or was with V recordings. Is that still going? So that was a single deal, but we got a we got a good relationship. So I can I can send them stuff. If they like it, we'll we'll work with them. Okay. Yeah. So it's one of those where you can send them loads of things, they can reject loads, but 20 down the line they might say, Yeah, we'll take that. Yeah, one. man. So it's open-ended. We got a really good relationship. Like 
um, like Brian G, legend. And our first conversation, like when I sent in the, the track before, and he was like, yeah, I like it. And I'd, bearing in mind, I spoke to every drum and bass label. So I've spoken to everybody and I wasn't, I wasn't feeling the vibe of some of them. Like they were big, but I just, for my first release, I was like, nah, I got, it has to feel right. I spoke to people that had worked with him before and they're like, yo, you got to talk to Brian, man. So I sent, I sent the track through. They liked the track. Brian calls me up. I don't think we even spoke about music. We just spoke about like life. He's from like, he's from ends, I'm from ends. And we just chat. I'm just like, yo, like this, this is the guy. This is somebody who really loves music and has an ear, like has an ear for music and can, can like, I need to be guided. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in a scene that I'm not 100% comfortable in. I know, I know rap, I know hip hop, I know that world, forward, backwards, sideways, you know what I mean? Drum and bass, jungle, it's different. I need somebody who can be like, no, 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 this is the way we go, this is how we do this, this is the way, yeah, yeah, you're on the right path, but you're on the wrong, tra on the wrong track, like, switch it up, and that's what he does. A an amazing ear for music, and yeah, it it's, so far it's worked, man. How did you get in with Marshall? Because, I mean, that's kind of a big move as well. Yeah. So Massive. is it is it a case of the stars just aligned? 100%. So this was, so again, I'm part of Mobile One Song. We're doing, we're going to different places, talking to different companies, um, panel talks. So we're talking to PRS and we've gone, one of the days is a day at Marshall. So we've gone to meet them and we're talking to the head of the label. We're talking to the, head of the agency, all that kind of stuff. And they're just, they're just breaking down the industry. Um, I, I, I asked the question and the head of the agency was like, you want a job? I was like, everyone's laughing, like, yeah, whatever, cool, cool, cool. So when we finished, everyone's packing up and going. He's like, here's my email. Email me now. Email me now or now. you just done it? Email okay. me right now. Okay. I emailed him. Cool. He said, right, cool, we're gonna chat. And that was it, man. He just so from then he said, I've seen what like you've spoken about what you've done. I'm seeing what you're doing as far as like booking tours for yourself. Could you do that for other artists? Could you... Um, so you became a booking agent? Yeah. Okay. So could you build life strategy for other acts? And I was like, I don't know, man, but I'll try. And I spent a year kind of really just learning, learning the industry, just watching and seeing how things went. And then I started signing acts that I thought I could work well with and I could be of value to. And it's working really well, man. We signed some some big acts, like I said, we, we signed Manga, Kalashnikov, M24. Is, is the Kalashnikov thing now? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. wicked. Yeah. So we've got stuff to look forward to. Yeah, man, so yeah. like. And Manga as well, right? Yeah, yeah, like Manga's on tour right now. Yeah, wicked. Isaiah Dreads, like. Yeah, we signed a dope artist as well. Yeah, so it, from my thing is just like, I'm looking at what you're doing online. I'm looking at what you're doing musically. And then I'm figuring out where the gaps are, where's the gaps to get you to that next level? How do we start? I say this, it's all about traction, man. How do we build traction? Um, how do we come up with a, a viable strategy that's gonna work repeatedly? Something that we can continually work on. And yeah, we're trying to grow year on year. So a lot of our strategies are like five year strategies. So you're here at the moment, where do you wanna get to? Uh, we wanna do, I don't know. We want to do Red and Leeds Festival. All right, cool. This is the plan. We need to get you to that to that that point. How many tickets are you selling now? Selling thirty tickets. Cool. Where do you want to get to? We want to sell. We want to, we want to do a thousand tickets. Cool. We know we know how these points we need to get to to get you to that point where you can sell out Scala or whatever. Basically, now you've got not just your foot in the door, but your whole body in the door. And um, mm. you, you basically understand the business from a business perspective in a different light to ever before. A hundred percent, man. I think the, the mobile unsung, like big up wisdom, big up wisdom, wisdom runs mobile unsung. So wisdom is like, he's like an angel out here, man. Because wisdom is someone who's putting people in positions to kind of learn the industry. So me and him are so similar, man. We've got very similar backgrounds. And one of the things, we had this conversation the other day, Part of the problem is artists don't, they don't know what they don't know they don't know. So you're trying to do this thing here, but you there's this too much that you, you're just not aware of. And 
you need somebody who's inside to tell you, oh, no, that's not how you do it. I said this to Nova the other day. The fact that we got as far as we did doing everything wrong is a miracle because we did everything wrong. Even selling CDs on the streets, that wasn't the right thing to do, but where we were, it was the only way we could have done it. So we just had to do it. And what we learned from that, then we then use. But there's a reason why no one in the labels has their artists out selling CDs. You say that, but the label have got street teams out on the streets. They do. Well, yeah, they did. The same difference. Yes, it, it, was, it was very similar. It's very similar. But again, it's like part of the independent journey is being able to make those mistakes. Part of the trick with major labels as well is they'll sign artists, but they'll also kind of tell them, don't let anyone know you're signed. Let's keep your street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a strategy to it. A hundred percent. I speak with people regularly. Like, I can eyeball it. So I can I can see what moves are made and I can tell if somebody has some backing, yeah? Like, it's not hard to tell. And But I understand why they don't want it to be shown because of just the optics of it. You said it's not hard to tell. Mm. There was no physical, visual thing that gave away that this person was signed. Right. It was just the personality had changed over the period of a few weeks. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I, I could see there was a different buzz about them. Yeah. They were still turning yeah. up in their mom's box or Corsa. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? See, see, <laughs> and all see, that. See. Nothing had changed. See, okay. So to be able to mm. suss that out, I think that's deep. Yeah, I can't I can't suss it like that, but I can just tell where where posts start spiking and songs start getting on certain playlists, then I'm like, okay, you're obviously with certain distributors or certain artist services and I know they only work with certain people cool or you get certain freestyles and I mean I can see and go all right cool 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 I see where you're going and, and to be honest though there's like you don't even have to be signed to a label you could be just with a certain management company you could be with like you look at like Rock Nation Rock Nation is not a record label but when you're with if you're signed to them as a management you're going to be doing super well even with certain booking agencies, you're certain with certain agencies or talent agencies, you're going to be making moves that no one else is really making, even when you're not signed. So again, it's like, there's a lot of loopholes into like how people get to certain places and how things look um, from the outside. Let's move on to some general chat um, about just the industry and the way artists kind of present themselves and all that kind of stuff. I mean, first of all, what is the purpose of the music for you? I think there's two levels to it, man. I think it allows me, it's cathartic, so it allows you to kind of like, it's my therapy, man. So it allows me to just say the things I want to say, out, put out in the open. It allows me to tell people around me what I want to tell them without telling them. So that's, I think that's kind of like level one. Level two is, it is a business, but more than a business, it's almost like a, um, a front, front of house, it's like a shop window. So it allows me to be visible in certain spaces for then me to get other business. So a lot of the stuff I do, like even when it comes to um, some of the youth programs we put together, that only really works because they know I'm a rapper. So that's for that. Some of the voiceover stuff, that works again. They know I'm a rapper, they hear my voice all the time. Um, even moving forward and some, some stuff that will happen over the next couple of years, the acting and the TV stuff, again, it comes because I've got cachet, I've got a bit of a name within the music industry. So I feel like that's why I do it. I feel like that's what it's for. Um, and it's fun, man. Like I just, I just, I, I love everything about making music and I even love the industry. Like, even the good, the bad. I love the fact that it's not, like, it's tough, but I even love that. It's a challenge, isn't it? And people yeah. like us, we love challenges because that's I what drives it. us. I love it. Like, I would say, if I would never do the lottery just in case I win it. Because <laughs> that would just fuck up my life, man. <laughs> like, I'm, I don't want, if someone was to go, yeah, yo, it's 20 mil, I'd be so depressed, man. Because I wouldn't, because then it's like, all right, cool. I'm a. I'm just gonna. I, I honestly, I I just have to give it give it away. The, I really love the journey. I really I really love the destination is cool, but the journey for me is what it's about. Which is why, like, even when people talk about my, my 
I have this thing now where everyone loves my, I'm out and people just see my car and they're like, oh, that's it, bro, I love your car. Da, da, da. And I'm like, yeah, no, nah, it's cold, it's cool. But I was, my, my favourite car was my Fiesta. That was my favourite car. And the reason why that was my favourite car, that was the first car I bought. So that was the first time where I was really like, right, cool. I just passed my test. Um, I'm, I'm grinding, putting some money together. Like the clothing line is doing well. And I know, like, I just want enough money to, to, to get that. Like, that was the goal. And I got it. And it was sick. It was, just, to me, it was like, I finally, like, did something. Now nah, this other shit's too easy. Like, yeah, we just get a car whenever you want. But then it wasn't. Like, 2016, 17, 18, they were tough years. They were years where I really did have to grind to, like, get things done. Like now, it is. It sometimes it does feel a little bit like, eh, yeah, the, it's, it's not the same. It's not the same. When I first started the clothing line, it's not the same as it was now. I had to, I had to really grind to put all that together. When this and my hustle first started, it was a grind. Now, we just post stuff up and people buy it. That's cool. I love it. But it's not the same as when I was really like, I just spent four grand on clothes. And I've got to get it sold because I've got no other money. Like, it's a different vibe, man. When things become easy, it's like you start looking for the more difficult things, so... That's why I think even moving to, like, like drum and bass and garage and jungle, I think, is, is cool for me because it's like, in, in this world, like I'm, ve I'm very well respected in, in, in hip-hop music. Coming out of that world, even when I did Vision, Vision was a grime album. It was the first time I'd done a full grime album and talking to, like, grime acts and almost feeling like they don't know me. So I've got, to, I mean, I've got to like, I'm in a, it's new school. I'm in a new school. Like I was the, I was the man at the old school. Yeah. But I come into a new now school. You've got I'm to a prove new yourself kid. again. Yeah. And I felt, and it was like, it was cool. It was a really good feeling. So I feel like that's why coming into the, the drum and bass scene is the same thing. It's like, yeah, no, nah, we know what you did there, but over here is something different. You've got to prove yourself again. And does that ever stop though? Nah, it doesn't. It doesn't ever stop because I think I think like what happens is you move into different arenas. So even if you think about it in the business world, so we, you go from like having, you, you go from, clothing line's a good example. So you're, you're selling your clothes online, you've got your little online shop or whatever, and that's cool. But then you move into like doing the pop-up shops and then you're, now you're around other people that do pop-up shops and now you're seeing what they do and then you're doing the fashion shows and then you're, you're like, it moves up and then you start talking to people who, are really big in the game who have sold their stuff to JD and then you're like, right, that's the level. And you you keep you keep like moving up that way. So there's always a goal. There's always somewhere to 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 get to. And I and I and I always try to like be around people who are doing better than me because I feel like that's it's no point looking back at the people that ain't succeeding. Yeah. To, yeah, yeah. to try and learn how to succeed. Yeah. <laughs> nah, I I I I, I want to be on those tables. And with people talking about stuff that I'm just not 100% in on and learning and, and kind of going, okay, this is how that's done. And it, it, it's very similar to what we've done in the music industry where you, you know, you work at it, you do your little thing, then you get brought in and you kind of see more what's going on and you go, oh, oh that's how that's done. That's how that's done. I spend a lot of time, like, when I'm in, in the office um, talking to the, the head of music at Marshall and he's someone who's been in the industry for 40 years and started off as an artist, then a music manager, then a label boss and working with, like working with big stars and, and has his his peer group are people that are massive in the game, like worked with all the biggest stars and stuff. And hearing how he speaks about the industry and just listening and going, right, cool, okay. I'm trying to make sense of it all. I'm trying to figure out like what is the... Yeah, what's the, what's, what do I need to know? What don't I know and what do I need to know? One thing that I've like always come across in my time when I was recording, every time I did a new track, I felt like that was the one that was going to blow. Yeah. And it was always the one that I least expected that made the most noise. Have you, have you ever had that? Every time. That? Every All the time. time. That's the way it's, always, it's always... Every song I make, I'm like, this is the one. This is the one that's going to blow. And then it doesn't. But then my bigger songs are songs that we just, I just done really quick. Vision, I think, is my biggest solo track. And that was just, I think I did that whole song in about half an hour. It was like, the album was over and I was like, oh wait, I've done a whole album called Vision. I haven't done a song called Vision. I was like, I better do a title track.
and I made a real simple beat and just it was it, it was like I don't want to I don't want to rap 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 I just want to just talk about some stuff and I just did that and that's a song that blew done really well online but it's also the song that people contact me the most about and they're like yo I really love that song and I'm like I don't get it I'm like I did some stuff in it I'm like yeah it's a good song but I'm like have you heard the other stuff because there's some bangers, like really good songs on there that you like ain't listening to, but whatever. But um, yeah, I think, I think in a way that in a way that's kind of cool because it, it lets you know, yeah, it's not really up to you. Just make the music. Like your job, make the food, send it out. You don't get to tell them how it tastes. With music, I think if you hear it, say you hear it in your room at 12 o'clock at night, Mm. It's different to hearing it in a football stadium 100%. at two o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? A hundred percent. So I was at Mango Show last week and I'm with my wife and I'm like, I wish I could hire a club out to make music in while people are there. <laughs> so like you could just, you can be in the environment <laughs> and see what works in that moment yeah. and see what sounds work. So I wish I had, I wish I had access to that, to that, just to that kind of thing. And I think when we were, I think we kind of used to, like even back in the day where, like Kung Fu days, like you would have a track and the DJ would play it and you could kind of see and see like, oh, cool, see what works, like see what works. But yeah, I think my, now I'll play a song and I'll just look at the reactions of my family. I'll just see like, who's like, they're paying attention. Like, do they stop? Do they stop talking? But I feel like when you catch one, when you really catch one, you'll, you'll, you'll well, know it. You've got a catalogue that is immense, right? Mm. There's not many people can brag about, I've got 10 albums and 784,000 million collaborations. All it takes, I think, is... Like, look, how many times have you seen somebody in a movie and not realised like they were in movies 20 years before? Yeah. And now you're going back and, I don't know, you're watching some old movie and you're like, wow, that was Sylvester Stallone. Yep. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's crazy, isn't it? That's the same with music. It is. One of my biggest songs is um, one of the tracks off the Crate Crusaders album. Um, I think it was what I call What I Am. And that's been, yeah, that's on like half a million streams or something close to that. And that was, that came out originally in 2010. That's only been on streaming for the last three years. I've never promoted it ever. I've never played it to anybody. I've never said, yo, check this out. We just, I spoke to um, uh, Bad Habits one day and was like, bro, should we put this on streaming? He's like, yeah, okay, cool. We did it. It's gone off. I, I don't even like the song. My biggest, I've only got one track that I would class as like UK hip hop that's done well. All the rest when it comes to streaming has been drum and bass or garage or grime. There was a good choice to change direction. Dude, oh, there, was, there was one time when, when my top five tracks were all different genres. Yeah. Like, and that's kind of like how I want it to be. I want to do, I want to do other stuff. I, I joke all the time about doing like a bluegrass album, but like or country or folk or because I I just want to do different stuff. Like I'm definitely gonna do a Scar album. Like that's that's definitely gonna happen. Like Tom Kawan already sent me some stuff for that. Like yeah, I want to do an '80s pop album. Like I want to do stuff where you don't even know it's me. On the phone when we spoke, we were talking about producers and beat makers, and I've said this in a couple of other interviews, but. I'd like to get your opinion on the difference because I know what the difference is, but what's your opinion on a, a producer and a beat maker? I think a lot of people are beat makers. That's where you're just putting the song together. Um, I think producers are more really curating the whole sound. So you might have a producer who doesn't even make the beat. So a lot of, time, a lot of stuff that Dre does, Dre's not really a beat maker anymore. Um, Kanye's not really a beat maker anymore. The, the ghost production, is like is massive, um, but it's down to people like JD. People just having an ear, like a real. Actually, now JD is a bad example because JD is a beat maker and a producer. But it's people having an ear for music. DJ Khaled having an ear to go, yeah, now nah, change that, make that different. Do this. This should be here. That hook came, comes in. Nah, nah, middle eight. Left, like really directing the track and how it should sound and kind of just. Really having a Rick Rubin, man, might be one of the greatest. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, so just having a, a yeah, ear for music, and I think that's what kind of sets people apart. If you if you are if you are a good beat maker, that's where you want you want to find someone who's a good producer, and to be able to go, yeah, that that should be like that. Change that. Do that. When I work with Shapes, that's how we work. 
I might come with the original, with like the, uh, the foundation of the song, but then shapes will go, nah. When I listen to your music, I've always felt that the beats were good and all that. And, you know, it was all put together really well and whatever. And, but I've always felt like that one big thing is missing. Okay. And you're, that you're ready for that. Mm. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. I'm not saying that to be like controversial or mm. like against what I'm saying. What you're doing is dope. Mm. But imagine if now you had whoever was producing Tiny Temple or someone yeah. and they just did that last touch. Yeah, production yeah. values are important, man. And, you see, and you see what I'm saying? 100%. I believe you could blow. I think like even with, if you look at, I'll give you a really good example. So Blurred um, came out before Vision. So Blurred Vision goes together, you get it. Vision came out in 2020, 2020 Vision. Um, so like the, the reason why, if you listen to Blurred, Blurred's a good album. It's cool, sick. But it's not as good as Vision. Because Vision had somebody else who was a really good producer and engineer to be on top and just give it that polish and to like give it that different dynamic. Whereas when I'm just, when it's just me by myself, I'm, 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 I'm a very, very lazy beat maker. Like I don't, I, I get bored quickly. The drum, did the drum sound okay? Guess so, I don't care. <laughs> like, this was, a, is a sample good? Yeah, cool. But again, it's like, you, you got to do what you do, man. You got to work with how you work. And I think for, for me, I would rather have the song come out than it not come out. And if it means I've got to wait, I'd rather just not wait and just do it myself and just have it out. Quick fire round, right? Um, consistency, importance of consistency. That's number one. Consistency is everything. Consistency kills, that's everything. Being consistent is the most important part of... I'm not the best, I'm no, nowhere near... I might say I'm the best rapper, yeah? But if I say I'm the best rapper, I'm lying, right? I'm not the best rapper, but I'm one of the hardest working. So I just outwork everybody. That's what I do. So being consistent is super important. If you even look at like um, me coming out, the times I came out. So you look at like the MySpace days, I was mad consistent. Jumped over a lot of people. Facebook, I was mad consistent. Jumped over a lot of people. Twitter, I was mad consistent. Jumped over a lot of people. Just being consistent, just putting stuff out. Just like doing it. So yeah, 100%. Disorganised artists. I, I guess being a disorganised artist is almost like the, the default of, an, of a creative. Like we're just, we're scatterbrained in it. But you need to figure out a way to make it work. So whatever you have to do to get to your end goal, you have to do it. So you can't go, you're driving, your car breaks down, but you're not home. You can't just go, oh, oh well, I'll just stay here. No, you still will get home. So if you've got to walk, get a bus, get a, whatever you need to do to get to that end result, you have to do it. So you need to figure out a way, a way that it works for you. But I think the majority of artists are disorganised, but it's not the best way to be. Artists that basically have a couple of demos or tracks or whatever on Bandcamp but feel the world owes them something. To be honest, those, like, I think at this level, they're ones I, I, I don't even see. So I wouldn't even be able to tell you who's doing that. I think when I was younger, there was a few people that had a few tracks out that I thought they were like the greatest. But then I, I, I kind of would have put myself in that category as well. Because even when I only had a few tracks out, like I thought I was amazing. But it's not about do some other tracks. Like, are you still going to be here? It's like Drake said, we'll see you still here a decade from now. But are you still going to be here in 10 years time? in 20 years time and is it going to be beneficial for you to have been here that time what did you do and I've said this many times we see we we can see who works the results are very clear like we know who's putting in work to even put themselves in positions to end up on Wembley stages or on the front of a fucking bus but we know who done the work so the results are there there's some lyrics I want to quote Okay. Um, f first of all, Father's Day. Just tell me really quickly about Father's Day. Father's Day was uh, a song that I just I felt was important to do. It was about it was for my dad and for my daughters, um, and it was yeah a track that I really really liked, really loved, and it was something that I thought was going to be again. It's, it's, it's legacy music, man. It was just it was literally just made for for me and my family. Uh, it's a wicked song, bro. Thank you, man. It's brilliant. It's one of those ones I'm talking about. If the production was on a whole different level, yeah. that would be a whole different yeah, level. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, and I'm not saying that disrespectfully. No, nah, I, I yeah. agree. I right. agree, man. Okay. But I can only produce as well as I can produce, man. <laughs> I've written a few lyrics uh, down, like that I thought, like basically hit me in the face, like yo. Yeah. So 
The first one, I mean, this is mostly from Battle Cry. Of course, I'm the last man standing. I was built to last. The reason I picked that one is because you proved it. You know, you're still here, where a lot of people fell by the wayside, disappeared, whatever. Then um, there was like, last year, I used to email DJ Heat and get no reply. Where was the common decency? Mm. I feel like that, for me, a lot of people go through that. Quick, quick description from yourself. You're going to have that, man. I think, again, it comes down to, like, you thinking that you're the centre of the universe. Like, you can send DJ stuff, but if they don't really know you, then they're not really going to, they're not really going to, like, respond the way you want them to respond. Maybe they're just busy. But, again, man, it's up to you to, how do you make yourself known? Like, if they're not seeing you, if they're not seeing you on the emails, then find out where the office is, man. Go, go drop us some music or just get in front of them. Just do what you got to do to, to get heard. Now they see me in the streets and want to speak to me because my stock is rising like childhood obesity. <laughs> I'll be trying to punch. I don't really write punchlines like that anymore, man. But they're bad, though. <laughs> they're sick. I used to be a punchline rapper. Like, I yeah, used to, yeah. That used to be my thing, like, especially like Battle Cry days. Yeah. I'm just punching off. I'm just punching, 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 like, yeah. trying to do... But like it's like stuff. every line in that track was just a bang, bang, yeah, bang yeah, yeah. in your face. It was, it was dope, bro. That's how I used to write. I think yeah. like over, it's, it's a that's a young man's game. As I get older, man, it's like I don't wanna, I wanna tell you stuff. I wanna drop jewels. I wanna like really give you something to really relate to, rather than just make you laugh. Like I think back then I was just trying to say funny stuff. Any final words, bro? Nah, man. Just like big you up. Thank you for having me on the channel. Like I appreciate it. Um, yeah, everyone just, that's doing their thing, being creative, just keep doing it. Um, again, stay stay consistent. Um, yeah, if you can't stay motivated, stay consistent because the consistency will bring back your motivation every time. Big up Capo for saying that. That's yeah. what I've got to say, man. All right, we've been trying to get this for a long time, so I appreciate you coming down. Okay, so for anybody who has no idea who Genesis Elijah is. I hope you get to find out from this interview, but you should know who he is. He's done a lot of things and he's been around for many, many years, at least two decades now. So guys, do me a favor, go and follow Genesis Elijah on his social media pages. I'm gonna put the links in the description below and yeah, just make sure you go and support him on his Spotify, Bandcamp, everywhere. And if you're an artist and you're looking for a booking agent, Maybe that's the guy that you want to go to as well. <laughs> All right. Anyway, please subscribe to the channel. Click the bell to receive the notifications. Like, share, and get involved in the comment section below. And again, thank you for watching as always. And we'll see you soon. Peace. Gee, come on, man. <laughs>